Okay. All right, let's get started with this meeting of August 14, 2023. Um, I think we're in the quorum, so let's uh, make sure to have it if you want to do a roll call. Present. Thank you, Present. Commissioner Liu. Present. Commissioner Van Rees. Present. Commissioner Humayun. Present. Commissioner Texler. Here. Commissioner Whedon is absent. We have a quorum. Okay, very good. But if we have public comments on items not on the agenda, I believe we have one here in the room. And that would be Tony Miller. Hi. I don't know. I, oh, just hold on one second. Do I have anyone, any comments online? I don't see any. No, we don't have any. Okay, good. Um, so on this comment, I'm representing Greentown, and I just wanted to share that um, we have just completed a summer internship with four interns, two of whom focused exclusively on building electrification. They did over. They learned about the benefits to the city in achieving their cap. They um, interviewed over a dozen people, including Senator Becker's office, SBCE, and customers who. Um, uh, citizens who had fully electrified and wanted to, but were having challenges. They studied the rebates, et cetera. They distilled everything down into this pocket guide, which we are offering the city to have in planning department. Green Pound's going to be, um, it's going to be better free quality. This hasn't been officially printed yet, but the content's pretty much baked. Yeah. Um, it's going to feed to a website that we can keep updated as all these resources change. But um, the hope is that we can broadly distribute it to the city as a gentle um, guide to help encourage them to do building electrification and demystify the rebates that are out there now. So we just wanted you to be aware of it. And um, if you have any comments or hopefully support of it, we appreciate this. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. Uh -huh. Actually, if I may have one comment. Sure. I was wondering if you could put maybe at the bottom somewhere. I know it's not studied that city, but we have on the website, we have an electrification. Oh, also. yeah. In fact, um, if you scan the QR code, 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 one of the links will be to your city's website. Okay, that's, that's great. Thank you for that's that reminder. That's, that's, that's right, yeah, number three. Number three. Yeah, it doesn't, it's not all the way number activated one. just yet. Number one. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. So have a look at it, um, and then you can always get info mm -hmm. at greentownlosaltos.org for feedback to me. Somebody says the campaign has been disabled for some reason. Yeah, we're actually waiting for um, the clean air that feeds to the clean air website, and we're waiting for the tree ordinance, to, mm -hmm. the new leaf blower ordinance to fully um, kick in before mm -hmm. we make it go live. Okay. Yeah, I just think you think about putting a formal link to the to the web, the city website, to the environmental condition page about building electrification because that's the reference to a quote that you make. Okay. Right. So I mean that's up to you. Um, but I think would be useful, of course, especially if you do a wide distribution and the city is going to do some of that distribution as well, right? All right. Is that correct? Is that, I do think so. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any other comments? Three citations. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. We'll take the lesson and everything comes out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. So I guess we don't have any more comments, right? Okay, good. Um, let's move on. Then I wanted to uh, welcome Director Zones to the meeting. He's now he's no longer, he's, he's still in charge of development services, but now he's also in charge of environmental and sustainability mm -hmm. services. There was some changing in the department over the summer, and I will, uh, you know, hand it over to him, and maybe he can give us some more information about uh, some of the challenges. Yeah. So, um, hi, Commission. So, um, I'm not sure if uh, any of you had previously interacted with the former community development director, John Biggs. So, um, Environmental Commission used to be in the community development, um, which is now the Development Services Department. So still one in the same, just a rebrand that happened last year. Um, 
But uh, with that being said, is um, we did have a restructure and reorganization with our, um, as of tomorrow, officially retired public works director, Jim Sandoval. So at that um, kind of announcement is we took the opportunity to kind of really look at the um, kind of structure of how the city is organized. Um, so with that being said is Aida Fairman is now the public works director. There is no longer a um, environmental services and utilities longest department name on the planet um, anymore, uh, but all of the duties have been reassigned. So sustainability will be now be in the development services portfolio um, and then moving over from public works um, to development services is the land development engineering. So any type of private engineering um, reviews um, will be in the development services kind of authority. Um, so then Aida is left with uh, streets, sewers, um, the CIP engineering and transportation. Um, so those are the main disciplines that are underneath that um, umbrella now. So that will kind of help us to streamline the internal um, practices as well as kind of our external um, outward facing kind of projects and everything along those lines. Um, so there won't really be much of a change or an uh, interruption. Um, with that, though, an additional change is um, Casey, um, who is the other environmental coordinator, um, did resign from the city of Los Altos um, approximately three and a half weeks ago. Um, so we were very um, sad to see her go. However, she took an opportunity working um, in the city um, in San Francisco. So uh, biking distance from her apartment. So we're very excited for her to be able to um, do a very specific thing in the field that um, she'll still be working in, um, but something very specific um, to greening infrastructure um, in, in the city. So that is um, another significant thing. However, with that also being said, um, the development services department though has been working to fill some of the vacancies um, that uh, I inherited essentially. So I inherited, uh, seven positions with four vacancies. Um, so, and one of those was being Casey. So um, I will at least just share with the commission is that I took the opportunity to um, meet with some folks that were for a development services technician, which is um, essentially a cross discipline. Um, this person has a planning background, very similar to Casey. Um, and uh, we actually already have the replacement for Casey. So that person will be starting in September. So, um, there will be a little bit of a um, lapse of training and everything, but uh, realistically, that was a very quick um, recruitment for us to be able to execute. So that's a very positive thing for us to be able to share with the commission. Um, is there any other major staff updates that we're not going to cover in actual agenda items? No? So we have to do the yep. Okay. And then uh, did any of you have any questions about any of that? No. Yeah, good. Okay, Nora. No, oh, good. Okay. Pretty, pretty straightforward. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So moving on, we're going to go into the items for consideration or action. And first, the meeting minutes. Have you uh, have any of the commissioners' questions, comments about the meeting minutes? No, nothing, no, nothing. Can I get a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Okay, I'll take a vote. Uh, Chair Delany? Vote, yes. Chair Hecht? Yes. Commissioner Liu? Yes. Commissioner Van Rees? Yes. Commissioner Mayen? Yes. Commissioner Texler? Yes. Motion passes. All right, good. So, Keep moving on. Uh, we'll talk about the tree protection ordinance and get an update and um, some kind of a draft of what the change would look like. And I think it's coming from you, Tanya. Yeah, I'm going to present on that. So, Oops. 
So I'm going to give an update on the tree protection ordin ordinance updates. And um, I just wanted to go over some housekeeping items for the commission process for this item today. Um, so I'll go over the, uh, the proposed changes. And then once um, I've gone through my PowerPoint, commissioners can ask clarifying uh, questions and then we'll take public comment and then commissioners can discuss and then hopefully we can make a motion. Okay, so just to remind everyone in January, 2022, um, the city council discussed up updating the tree protection ordinance and um, so the current ordinance covers basic criteria such as procedures to remove a tree, criteria for removal, the approval process and appeals, uh, but it kind of lacks uh, defined standards for planners to effectively direct applicants and developers. Um, so sustainability staff worked with the environmental commission subcommittee, planning and building divisions and a certified arborist to identify um, areas in the ordinance that need to be updated. Um, then staff and certified arborists took all those recommendations um, and created some policy uh, recommendations that we'll go over today. Um, so, sorry. Um, all right, so some changes to the protected, the definition of protected trees. Um, we decided that, you know, based on the feedback that we would protect all trees at a diameter of 12 inches. Previously, it was 15. Um, so we're, you know, reducing um, or increasing the, reducing the size that we're protecting. Um, and, you know, this will help the city retain healthy trees that contribute to many things like stormwater and flood control, shade and mitigation of harmful, harmful greenhouse gases. Um, and that was kind of more aligned with other neighboring jurisdictions as well. And um, we also decided to add in the definition of protection of na native species, um, and those will be protected at a, a diameter of 10 inches. And that's important to preserve the unique landscape of our region and, um, you know, to create ur urban forest that is uh, drought tolerant, pest resistant, and benefits the well-being of birds and other wildlife. Um, it is also important to have, you know, a, di a diverse species of trees. Um, and, you know, we want to represent that in our uh, tree protection ordinance. Um, a lot of the feedback we got when talking to staff um, was that the decision making criteria was confusing. Um, that it wasn't, you know, it was a little um, objective. So um, we went ahead and and there was a lot of, uh, and if you pull up the, the attachment that I added into the agenda, um, number two, there was a, a lot of, you know, feedback on number two. So we completely removed that removal criteria and um, updated all of the criteria to this this new language here. And this is provided um, by the arborist. Uh, so we consulted with a certified uh, professional arborist and um, this is what they provided to us as well as we reviewed it and provided our feedback. So now the decision-making criteria is, you know, is updated and reflects goals of preserving and growing a healthy tree canopy. And it also provides residents and city planners more clarity um, and defined guidelines. All right, so um, for tree replacement criteria, um, we recommend this following replacement criteria, which is also informed by the arborist. So replacing a tree one-to-one -one with another tree that is comparable in trunk and canopy size. And then if that's not possible, then we'll move to replacing uh, a tree with two trees, you know, combined are comparable in trunk um, to the one that was removed. and. Um, this is kind of in the ordinance. We're just making it a little more clear um, and adding a new um, chapter with or section on tree replacement criteria. If the tree cannot be replaced on site, then we're allowing for an in lieu fee um, that we that will be put toward a public fund.
Um, okay, so there was a lot of conversation around tree permit, tree removal permit fees. Um, and I went ahead and got some of the data from the neighboring jurisdictions um, in the county and took an average of their permit fee. And so this is so $250.79 is there as the average permit fee of the county. Um, so and today I hope to we hope to make a motion on whether the commission wants to increase um, the fee, Los Altos's fee, and do we want it to be an average of you know the county, um, the county average, or you know what is what is the policy direction on that? And then I can come back to these slides later as well. Um, there was a lot of discussion previously about penalties, and um, so the removal penalty, if someone removes a tree illegally, is up to $1,000 fine, a citation, and they would also be required to adhere to the removal requirements. And we're also updating the street tree planting list, and we're also adding a private tree planting list. Um, so that was, that was some of the feedback we also got that this, the tree street, the street tree planning list was outdated and we worked with the arborist who, um, provided us a master tree list and, um, based on their expertise and what they recommended, um, that best suits Los Altos. We also were able to pr provide feedback on, on that. And the subcommittee was also able to, uh, review the tree lists. Um, so, um, the next steps would be if we, you know, come to a conclusion, make a motion today would be to, um, update the ordinance with the final policy recommendations, uh, take, take this to city council for the first reading and the second reading, um, and then update any necessary materials, um, after that. Thank you, Daniel. Questions? Questions, uh, comments, and discussion. There's no discussion, but questions or comments on what's being proposed. Uh, just a quick question. So, the up to $1,000 fine, um, there's a lot of leeway there with up to. So, how do you determine what the fine is? It's pursuant to our municipal code, chapter 1.20. Um, there's actually no negotiation for that provision, though. It's set by state statute. So we actually just discussed that further with the um, with the leaf flower ordinance as administrative citations is at 100, 200, and 500. The $1,000 maximum is to leverage it to be able to process it under misdemeanor provisions as allowed under um, civil proceedings. So. so so what does that mean? At the end of the day, it's a five hundred dollar fine at the most. No, it can be up. To, I I issued a thousand dollar fine two months ago is for someone you? taking one down. So it's up to you then, yeah. on your discretion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we we wouldn't really necessarily. It also depends on the severity of the tree that's being taken down. The one that was being um, carterized, essentially, with how bad it was getting taken down, was you know a seventy foot redwood tree. And so they got a thousand dollar fine for it. There's no way to come back from what they did to it. They top cut it. Um, some of the other trees are going to be from extensive pruning. So our um, ordinance does require a specific type of review for um, a limitation. And they, you know, if it's something that might come back, then we can leverage the the other fine structure. But the the one, two, and um, five hundred, those are for occurrences. So. I really would hope someone doesn't do one tree, then goes to a second tree, then goes to a third tree, because then we're going that way. So it's the up to maximum in order to be able to allow for the citation and administrative um, proceedings. And is that in line with neighboring 
cities will they'll 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 follow that same yeah so if you're so we're we are a general law city so we have to abide by the state statute unless we were to change and the council already has asserted that they have um zero um desire to change the provision from an infraction structure to a misdemeanor structure um in regards to the actual way that administrative citations are applied now you can process it even though the the, the threshold can go up to a thousand. You can still process as, as an infraction. So it's a very complex thing that we, the city attorney have gone back and forth with for the last couple of months. Um, but with that being said, is Palo Alto pretty much has a double threshold requirement. However, they're a charter city. So they do not have the same rules that we do for specific provisions of that in the government code. The only reason why I know all that is because we just went through this with the, the gas power leaf blowers. <laughs> just again, I guess to follow up on that, um, what are the criteria for the up to 1000? Is there a specific criteria that is, you know? No, it's, it's, it's literally verbatim. The section that she's referencing is just a little, small little snippet of mm -hmm. up to. But the section that allows for us to be able to apply the up to a thousand is essentially a, a copy and paste from the state statute that allows that provision to be applied. So does that mean is there does it not allow for say pegging it at one thousand or any tree with a trunk greater than twelve inches that would be a thousand automatically, or is there a process that would require the city to go to the, what that amount is going to be. No, I mean, I guess that there could be thresholds set set to say that, you know, at this at this level, then you're going to get dinged with this much of a of a fine. Um, it, it just it's, it's if we put something into this portion of the ordinance, but we're not going to be amending the other chapter that does leave it open ended. So okay. you can set different thresholds in each individual ordinance. So it's specific threshold up to a thousand dollars. It could be nine hundred. It could be thousand. Right. That could be set within the ordinance, but it can't go over. Correct. Yep. There's also um, it's essentially like a rule of proportionality. Is it's like how 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 many times can you charge that same fee over and over again? Where if it's the administrative citation route of the one, the two, and the five. Those have specific ones because it's a separate part of the statute. But like, if you, again, if you were to say, oh, they took down two trees, I'd have to consult with Julie Houston, the city attorney, to see is if we're allowed to, allowed to actually apply because that's a different section of, of the state law that the one is for occurrence and the other one is just for, it's just that that's the flat one time essentially fine structure. So if you were to take down five under the administrative citation section, you could do a hundred a pop for every trip, if someone cleared their entire backyard. The thousand one, it's a little bit, that part of the state statute's a little wonky. Okay, so just to further clarify, it's a thousand max per occurrence? Yes, yeah. Okay. So, so someone, is that per tree? Does that, does that mean? No, no, no so no, if you go under the administrative citation section, okay. which is the one, two, and five, you could do it for every single one. That's why it's it's going to be really hard for us to like put that specific in this ordinance. It's mm -hmm. it's really going to be on a case by case as to what did someone do. Now, if someone were to chop down one redwood tree like they did two months ago, they got a thousand dollar fine. If three years roll by and they do it again. It's a total separate, like the, the statute of limitations, everything, it, it totally rolls over. But when you do the administrative citation, I mean, you could be getting a $100 fine every single day until you rectify the problem, depending on what the citation is. Okay. Oh. So yeah, the, the citation component is very complex. Um, <laughs> so- $100 a day. Yeah. And it could, be, it could be $500 a day. It just depends on exactly what the nature is of, of the until violation. Until you well, yes, yeah. So for this one, it, I mean, it's just the fine. There's not really a um, the way that the administrative citation component really works is like if someone does like an illegal structure or an improvement, it's until you rectify and undo what you did or get a permit, it is a reoccurring fee per day. So it just again, it it really just depends on exactly what you're what you're applying it to. And then, sorry, last bit on that one. 
Plus the removal requirements, does that mean that they have to do it after the fact permit fees? Yeah. The permit, so whatever the permit fees determine, to be, they would have, that would be in addition to whatever is yeah. on. Okay. I guess I, I yeah, yeah. I, it's just like he said, it sounds a little bit complicated because yeah, it's like, especially if it's involved multiple trees, your penalty would be capped at a thousand, right? Okay. Um, yeah, that's, that's why the one thing I would write like to advise the commission is I don't think we need to get hung up on the violation component what we because really what the commission was tasked with was to develop what's going to be essentially like our removal um, criteria what's going to be our replacement structure um, and those are actually the critical things that actually happen because at the end of the day if something truly is warranted under an emergency um, uh, scenario anybody can remove it and if they are able to justify it after the fact I mean for example there was um, a house off right off of San Antonio for all extensive purposes the tree looked very healthy the neighbors hate me um, but at the end of the day when they chopped that down and there was a stump the entire middle of the tree was hollow all the way down to the root structure so even though something at face value looks very healthy it was very similar to the three oak trees that were ordered to be removed on city hall property all three of them were dead and dying and full of decay so at the end of the day there's certain nuances to the tree protection this is just supposed to be really what's going to be our replacement criteria because at the end of the day you know we have nothing that truly is a black and white on certain um removals that says hey you have to do a two to one i'm just throwing that number out there um, for a replacement, or it needs to be of this specific size. I mean, you could go and get a one gallon tree and say, oh yeah, we're going to replace that. And well, that's really, it's really crappy at the end of the day that it's going to take how many years and decades to get back to the full maturity. So, um, you know, that's, that's really what the ordinance needs to focus on just to further clarify. I have another question. I don't know if it's a clarifying question or if it's a discussion question talk about the full majority. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, I guess that's also kind of um, sort of fuzzy in terms of what does full majority mean? Mm -hmm. Is it a hundred years or is it you know right? So is is that a legal requirement for it to be full maturity, or could it be something that we could state, you know, within ten to within fifteen years, some some period of time? Because there are some very slow growing trees that you can plant at, uh, you know, even uh, even a 24, mm -hmm. 24 inch box. I'll whatever. let I'll let Tanya talk to that because she did speak with the arborist who was, you know, I will say the arborist that we had on call for this did a fantastic job and really kind of helped answer a lot of the nuanced questions of stuff that you know we have our limitations on so go ahead yeah and that that was recommended by the arborist and they said mature for the circumstance means a tree that has reached its full size potential under average conditions and then each tree species has a different mature size mature size can be determined by looking at the cow poly select tree website or another resource um, so that was their answer to the okay. treaty. Okay, I guess beyond that, we can have it as a discussion thing. And one clarifying question for me, and I wonder if that's okay. Did you say you took out the ability to move a tree for economic reasons? Yes. So Number no longer three. can a homeowner remove a tree to put in a pool or something like that? It's well, so so no, there's, there is a, and I can just speak to it because it ends up, facilitating me as the approval authority is so then it it then adds and replaces preservation of a tree um that would impede or significantly limit the use of real property and no reasonable feasible alternative um exists to preserve the tree in the current location so realistically as if someone and there are some we have some that have you know um some redwood trees in the middle of their backyard and realistically i mean uh, a lot of people think redwood trees grow down, they grow out. Um, that's their root structure predominantly. Um, I mean, that's why, you know, you look at the ones in, you know, Redwood Grove is there's some that are growing perpendicular and they won't fall over because their root structures are grabbing all around instead of just below. 
Um, so realistically, what we're what that will allow for is for the determination to be um, made on a case by case basis. It will be similar to essentially the wording. It's but we have had folks that have made creative arguments in the past after consulting with um, staff that have been here for a long time. So like my executive assistant has been here for 20 years and she's she's seen some interesting ones because she's had to approve permits, you know, 20 years ago when she first started here. Um, and so they've, you know, definitely tried to use and leverage the economic um, enjoyment or whatever the term is that they use um, in the existing ordinance. So it should be changed to that it impedes the actual use of real property. Um, and then that will just have to be justified. Uh, one of the cases is that what if a data fact a residence foundation, you know, some of the tree. So um, what what can be done in the cases like that? Right? Like their own, um, their yeah. own, it's like it's their no. own foundation and their tree, or no. is that, are you referring to neighboring? Because we've had both come up since I've been um, here even. <laughs> We can uh, maybe take a look at affect their own mm -hmm. foundation and also maybe their plumbing system, mm -hmm. right? If someone moving the house, but the tree was already there 35 years ago, mm -hmm. but it, it does affect mm -hmm. uh, their living quality. So for cases like that, what can be done? Well, so we would, I mean, if it's impeding the actual, and we would do that under today anyways, is that we would allow the removal of the tree because I mean, that's that's mm -hmm. impacting the actual structure. The I will say though, the, um, the plumbing system is a little bit tricky because realistically, sometimes if someone has a really old plumbing system like clay pipes, I mean, yeah. roots are just gonna invade and they're just gonna destroy the system anyways and those need to be replaced regardless. Um, but yeah, we have had several cases that have um, had uh, actual um, foundation, um, you know, uh, unfortunately, uh, some some pretty big uh, issues with it and we've had to allow the tree removal. It's just It's just necessary. Yeah. Okay. So th those will be assessed and evaluated. Right? Yes. Okay. Good. So for the neighbor, if it's a neighbor, I guess it's it's your tree, but it's closer to the neighbor's boundary, and then there. So what we have had to do is, in order to help reconcile, um, and it's inevitably not. It is ends up being a civil matter at that point, unless it's obviously a city tree, which it's usually not, because we'll just say, okay, fine, we don't want the liability as the city. But realistically, what we have had to steer um, neighbor to neighbor conflict in is, OK, go and get an arborist that can look at the root system that's, you know, essentially becoming invasive at some point because it's growing beyond the confines of their parcel. Um, and then obviously you need to reconcile if it's a foundation, you know, um, issue or if it's a, you know, a plumbing issue. A lot of times you can see what root systems there are for plumbing problems because they do, you know, the um, the CAM systems that go in and see exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you're able to link it back to the tree, usually, you know, the neighboring property owner has said, okay, well, there's an arborist that's saying this is the tree that's causing your issues. This is the one that needs to be removed. Arborists will not just come out just to say, oh yeah, preserve this tree in kind. They'll come out and tell you which one of the trees that's surrounding your house is ruining your foundation. Um, they do it regularly in Los Altos. Gong? I feel like my comments are more discussion based. Okay. And Laura? I don't have any questions. Okay, so I, I have some... Uh clarification questions, I guess. Um, so I have to refresh my memory. So I went back to the website and looked at what we had. Uh, the definition of protected trees, um, in what we have on the website now, I just wanted to make sure I understand what I'm looking at. It says any tree that is 48 inches or greater is supported on some measure that 48 inches above the ground. Now you're saying it was 15 inches or am I confused? Yeah, so it's 15 inches in diameter and it'll be 38 inches in circumference. 38 inches in, okay. Yeah, method of measurements. Oh, right, 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 okay. And that's consistency, right, with so other like jurisdictions. Yeah. We're going to just 15 inches in diameter. 12 inches in diameter. Near 48 inches in circumference. Yeah. Right. So that's going to be, you said that's going to be what? It's, it's going to be 38, 38 inches 38 and 12 inches. inches in diameter. At 12 inches. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
the there was a definition also there are still protected trees uh, any tree is designated by the historical commission as a heritage tree are we replacing that by native tree now or is that different no that's staying the same we're just adding the native tree definition in there so we're we're adding like a section or some a, a sentence in there to protect native trees at 10 inches Okay, so, as well as heritage yeah, tree. So it's in addition to you, right. you're adding native tree to mm -hmm. what you had. Okay. Yeah. Okay, right. Um the tree removal criteria you say are the old one, you're removing the economic and the uh, other enjoyment of property kind of rationality. Yes. Correct. Okay, so that's fine. And then um uh, Yeah, so in the new tree removal criteria and number three, you have, um, you say we interfere with the utility, public transportation, waterway or the public infrastructure system. Do we have any particular definition of utility or public transportation? What I mean by that, for utility, we could say underground only because if it's above ground, you can always trim the tree to leave access. So the, I'm asking the question whether we're going to define that a little bit further or leave it open. And then public transportation is the same. What do we mean by public transportation? We, we assume sidewalks and roads, or do we define it more? Um, we can go back and define them, but I think some of the that language is already in the ordinance we can leave it for the discussion i'm just asking the question as a clarification yeah. point if you think. yeah so um so one thing and we just kind of talked about this recently at the city council um and you can agree or you can disagree but in practicality of use of actually ease of application is the more you tie my hands in the nuances of everything that happens in the development environment I can't apply what you specifically say when you have things that are more open ended when transportation, um, you know, if you say yeah oh it's just sidewalks, but why is it just sidewalks. It doesn't say just sidewalks unless you change the definition to just be sidewalks it's not just trees that are overhanging unless you change it to be when you guys specify some of the definition. Definitions aren't me meant to be explicit all the time, depending on what the regulation is. For something like this, it ends up allowing for us to capture more when we're actually doing the review. Um, and I mean, and that's just that's just a part of the nuance. So the more and more that we specify for something like if we were to define utility or public transportation, um, anything like that, it's going to really be very specific um, and that's just how we would be limited um, in the future moving forward with the reviews. So what you're saying, you uh, so, but you need to apply specific criteria, right? I mean, you, you need to, I mean, it's either any utility, doesn't matter whether it's below or above ground, you can remove a tree. So there's a branch that's tickling a, an electricity line or phone line. Mm -hmm. you, you could argue that the, the tree needs to be removed when actually cutting the branches would be enough. Yeah, but we, what, we do that all the time. That's not something that right. this ordinance protects. No, I'm just asking. It. Yeah, just want to Our, we have. Yeah, well, that and that's the explanation is that we have an on staff person that literally sends out letters weekly to property owners that says you need to trim this your tree back. Otherwise, we will do it for you. And then we send you the bill for it. They always obviously do it um, themselves. We, that happens all the time. That's a part of the, the Boulevard's um, street crew at MSC. Okay. All right. So yeah, as long as there is a we have a process, that's just what mm -hmm. we want to make sure. So for maybe well yeah, go ahead. topic, I guess the clarifying point, which maybe I think what we're not trying to get to it, which I think maybe the commission may be also interested in is making sure that there's no uh that there is limited criteria where a tree is taken down if there is right. So there's we want fewer um non-objective cases where a tree could be taken down we'd want to protect trees as far as possible right so if it's so that's where i think the questions are going is it is it clarifying that you know you cannot take a tree down just because a you know 
touches a, a wire, it does something. So it's it's more not tying your hands for or protect, you know, what you know what I mean? It's it's making sure that trees are not taken down arbitrarily. Uh, yeah, and without you know, with an so I, one thing is not granted. Yeah, one thing that I'm gonna at least just share with the commission is so um, it's been a learning curve for me, even as the director in Southern California, they don't do tree removal permits unless you're Pasadena, <laughs> um, and that's just a fact. Um, but up here, it's been a learning curve even for myself professionally. My staff. I mean, for all of jokes aside, is like, you know, you kind of take the jokes from the movies, are tree huggers. They, every time we have had to take a tree down, staff is like, are we sure? What can we do? And it, I mean, it, it is a conversation. So when I say that, or when I see that the public um, asserts that staff doesn't know what they're doing, um, or that they are just all about taking down trees, Sorry. That's not the case. Um, and I know that there's a little bit of that sentiment right now because we did do a significant amount of tree removal permits, but we also lost power for almost a week in this city at the beginning of the year. And there was extensive tree damage um, in Los Altos um, that was all documented as a part of the removal process earlier this year. Um, so, I mean, there is quite the bit of sensitivity. Now, in regards to what you guys are wanting to do, there might be things that need to be further refined or, you know, just provided the direction so that Tanya can increase kind of the verbiage of what the intent is of this section of the ordinance. Purpose and intent, a lot of times people forget in ordinances that you do have to make sure that you actually say what the purpose and intent is, not just intent, tree protection ordinance. You don't repeat the title. You actually say what you're asserting in the ordinance, and that helps you bring it back to if you have more generalized definitions that this is what we're going to actually accomplish by doing so. So it's what you're saying is the intent is, is to um, make sure that we're preserving them as, um, as practical as possible um, and not allowing for them when there are alternatives to be um, to be done. All right. So I think we've that been. Um, so the other question is: so there is a tree planting list that's also on the website, right? That's going to be revised, I'm assuming. Yeah. So and it's going to be very then... different, or it's going to be just some additions, or it's going to be updated per the arborist and we're also adding the private tree planting list okay so that will be completely which was not included in there before mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. and that private tree planting list has i mean it's different reasons why it's different like food trees are allowed and that kind of stuff or is that or uh... yeah it's it it's per the arborist and they have you know their inventory that they use and they they work you know, with different cities here. And so they um, they also refer to uh, specific uh, websites, um, trying to remember the one that they talked about, but um, so it's just more updated in it and it has I'll, a comprehensive- I'll help explain that. So there's, so there's a little bit of a, when you're looking at street trees um, versus when you're looking at private property trees, private property trees can kind of grow in any which direction that you want, really. They can be kind of the low, stumpy looking ones. <laughs> they could, but realistically, street trees, you don't want trees that are, um, you know, kind of like the, the you know, African, um, you know, acacia trees that are growing low and out because then you're constantly having to be mindful of trimming and making sure that it's not impeding sidewalks and traffic. Um, or even the electrical lines and things like that. So when we're planting new ones is that that list has to be cognizant of that. Um, additionally, a lot, what a lot of cities have further created as a criteria is that they have root systems that aren't strong root systems in regards to that they're not gonna buckle the sidewalks. Um, and so that's another big component of what street trees look at specifically versus private property trees. So that's really kind of the difference. There's kind of some of the, the more desirable specific specialty trees that you'd see on private property versus what you would see more regularly in, um, you know, on city property. Also, one of the big things is, is that, you know, for the public right of way street trees and everything, you really want it to be the absolute lowest water usage absolutely possible just because we really don't use irrigation anymore for the majority of them other than every once in a while or specific certain ones that we still have 
um, that are planted, um, where it's a little bit different for private property ones where you can actually do the hand watering and everything a little bit differently. Yeah, I just don't want to make sure we're not limiting what people can do too much also. Right? No, that was actually partly why we wanted to, is the the having only, that's actually really, and that was by actually my request is that we had two lists, is that the or the street tree one does limit you yeah. um, very specifically, actually, um, because we also have to worry about vector control issues with the street tree planting list. Where the private one, although people need to be cognizant of that or should be, um, they obviously have more specialty trees, like I was saying. All right. And then, um, so the fee, uh, the fee, $250 fee, that's the permit fee for removing the tree, right? That's the fee. No, that is, that number was the average of the fees in the county. Permit um, fees. The permit fee, yeah. yeah. All right, we included our current one for that was taken out of oh, that average. Uh, it took it out. Okay. Yeah. I think that's what I had. Um, yeah, I think that's what I had for the moment. Okay. Any other? Questions, comments? Uh, one question on the fee uh, that we're going to just talk about. So, so is that fee charged uh, for any tree removal, even if it's a sick and dying tree and needs to be taken out quickly? Or is there some incentive to remove sick and dying trees uh, by uh, waiving that fee? That wasn't something that I think um, any of the other jurisdictions specifically have. Um, if it's something that looks like an immediate hazard, you can do it under an emergency, which then you technically don't need um, okay. a permit for. If it's, but then that's really an extreme of that it's really bad. <laughs> Did you guys see anything else though that was like specific about like uh, more unhealthy trees not yeah. having a fee? Yeah, there were some cities. Some cities yeah. that did that. Yeah, I mean, it's, if you have a dead tree, you need to remove it. You need to pay a permit fee, right? If the tree is dead, right? It's a question mark. I mean, I guess you yeah. probably wouldn't have to, right? No, but I will say in the last, um, specifically in the last six months, because of all the winter storms that we had, um, my staff frequently was coming to me with um, photos and saying, you know, they're asking, do they have to get a tree removal okay. permit for this? Because um, they were attesting they don't have a problem with it. Um, and they, because they wanted to be able to memorialize it, unfortunately, because they knew neighbors weren't going to love that the big, you know, big, beautiful tree was getting taken down, but they wanted something from the city to document that it was okay. Um, so there, you know, that might be advantageous for us to have something for, for the kind of the known trees to help memorialize it um, for some people to feel a little bit more comfortable when they're taking stuff down. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, Los Altos Hills um they do zero they don't charge for a dead tree and their their protection ordinance is only on oak trees um and then i saw some other cities who um reduce the fee for a dead tree you yeah, know because dead tree can buy pest mm -hmm. right well, they're, they're dangerous yeah. they're 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 dangerous. Dangerous. Yeah. or whatever okay. so, i mean i guess the different purpose of the tree protection ordinance and the fee going with it and correct me if I'm wrong is to you know uh, what does it take to replace that tree because uh, if it died it may have died of natural causes so we don't go after why the tree died but there could be if there's a your tree you want to get rid of on your property you could potentially let it die and then take it you know so I'm just saying that it's the in, if the intent is to be able to keep maintain the canopy for the city, um, then the fees is should be you know based on the tree that was fighting canopy, and then the second part of the of the permit the ordinance is the replacement. So if you just take down a dead tree uh, without getting that permit, then you don't go through the replacement. Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't want to go into the so discussion. Let's, yeah, that's, I'm just we, we, we can pointing keep to that, that and we can go but through the discussion. Unless there are any other questions like or clarification but, yeah. questions, yeah. We, can, we can move on to public comments, I guess. Is that, well, are we good? Yep. Yeah, okay. Laura, you good? Okay, so um, then I will allow public comments. Um, there is someone online. I don't know if that's someone who wanted to make a comment at some point on an item on the agenda. We got a an email, a big comment from them. So I don't know if that's the person that's on the phone there, or if it's someone else who wants to make a comment. Yeah, no hands raised here. Okay. All right. Okay, so we have uh, two public comments from the audience. Um, I will ask Connie to make the Connie Miller yeah, to make the on. first. Gary. Oh, Gary, so, <laughs> sure. I mean, I'm not trying to be. Thank <laughs> you. I guess on that. Yeah, Thank exactly. You. I appreciate that. Okay, Gary. Hello, I'm Gary Hedden, Lost Authors resident. Uh, thank you for uh, doing this. I thought the old criteria was uh, it had some big loopholes. I mean, to replace the tree for other enjoyment of the property and keep the driving truck to that. So this, this is definitely a step in the right direction. Uh, some things that were not included in the new criteria that I heard tonight were the uh, diameters. So that's that's the interesting information. I would like to see the tree list. I'm sure that'll be available at some point. I would find that I think that's important for somebody could vote. My council members could vote on that. Uh, item five. Preservation of the tree will impede or significantly limit the use of real properties. Blah, blah, blah. Is there a, actually a difference between impede and significantly limit? Because if there, if there is, fine. But I think to me, they're just redundancies. And I would recommend that you just have one of those. As soon as you add language, the, the legal minds kick in. Things get complicated. And then stepping back, what's really needed here? Is we need a master plan for the how do we get more trees planted in the state? So I, I realize this is one step of that process. And I, do, I hope that that is also being developed, not just that we have a list, but that we have a plan to get the trees planted, because that's that is the goal of the climate action adaptation plan, is get more trees. But otherwise, thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. Yes, thank you. I'm not speaking as somebody from Greentown. I'm speaking from somebody with observational experience as a realtor. And um, I want to first ask Green to clarify the definition of real property. Are you talking about the structure? Are you talking about swimming pools or what? There's a house on Alexander Drive for sale now where a grove of about five redwoods is um, pushing into a swimming pool, and it's only a matter of time that the the pool breaks. So I would just ask for clarification on that. Do you mean the structure? Do you mean all hard, hard surfaces and improvements? The second thing is um, I've seen too many developers go in and just say, oh, we'll just pay the fee and we'll go ahead and do this. And particularly as there's a relaxation of people being able to subdivide, lo subdivide lots, I would just say, it's not like they looked at the lot and said, one day after they bought it and said, oh, look, there's a tree here. They knew when they bought it that it was there. And so if there's some kind of a punitive measure, obviously $1,000 is not enough of a deterrent for those people with building multi-million dollar properties. Is there some kind of a deterrent you can have in the form of um, slowing down the development? Like if, okay, automatic six week hold on the progress or something like that. That should be have to grow in. a certain maturity. Yeah. Um, the other thing is um, a one-to-one -one replacement of a large tree is not equaling carbon sequestration. So I would request that you improve, increase the number of trees that you offset the large tree um, elimination from width. Excuse me. That's it. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Let's see whether there are any more comments online. Um, no. Okay, so we're moving on to the discussion section. I just wanted to mention there was in the packet, there was a comment also from the resident. I do hope you uh, looked at it. There were a couple of comments about there in there actually. 
Um, all right, so um, discussions. We hear from council member David potentially. I think you have thoughts. No, no, nothing. No, I'm <laughs> sorry. I'm just I'm I'm oh, man, in the peanut gallery. <laughs> the three of us are pretty much all of the same mind in support of this initiative. So okay. Um, Smith and one thing that I certainly I've raised previously that I feel like a two to one replacement is a better ratio just because yeah I we just the time to get to maturity for trees is just um feel right to me to do the one to one but I've voiced that multiple times and uh with yeah, the uh, yeah. so what is it now what are we one to it's one to one, one and, and okay you totally should be two one yeah are we going around and getting our yeah yeah we we, we just have any we just uh, you know, I think we could like each other, yeah. but I think that's our best. So, I mean, but yeah, the, the point is okay, so one to one, okay. assuming the one that's being, you know, you remove a tree and then you're going to replace it with another one. I'm assuming the definition of the one to one is the one that you're putting back in the soil is going to be similar to the in size and canopy to the one that was removed. Or so, do we need, or, or do we need to? open it up to more trees so that you know we have some kind of an equivalency there so the arborist is really big on stating that a one-to-one -one, there's no one size fits all and a one-to-one -one isn't always the best recommendation it depends on the site and if a tree is being removed because there's too many trees you know we'd have to look at that and see so it's a, it's a case by case thing um and overcrowding is, is a real issue so they were really not in favor of a one-to-one -one replace or of doing multiple two-to-one replacements we kind of pushed the envelope there because and said we, well we want to recommend the two-to-one um and so you know they said it was a case-by-case -case ba basis and it had to be re reviewed as part of the application package um so that is why we came to that uh, recommendation of two or more. Um, let me see what it says. Um, so two or more trees that are smaller but are comparable in trunk size at maturity. Yeah. So you you you're really trying to replace with the exact uh, size in terms of whether it's one tree or two trees or three trees. Mm -hmm. Right. You want yeah. to replace. You know, it's a one to one kind of. Yeah, and I will say that it's very nuanced. Like it's, it's. I'm not an arborist, and even after hearing the arborists talk about it, and even them, they seemed like it was hard for them to explain. It's like a very nuanced thing to replace the tree. So, um, and and you know, we recommended, you know, having. I think some other cities do. If uh, you know, this size was removed, then replace it with this this size. It's very just like. Um, it's not on a case by case basis, and they they definitely did not recommend that approach either. So, um, and they they even say like on on sites where there's smaller trees at maturity, um, then they do recommend more trees to be required. Um, so, for example, if a 45 inch diameter tree is removed and the applicant is proposing to replace with a species that would reach 20 inches at maturity, then then the arborist would recommend that two additional trees be required. So it's like it's very nuanced um, in in what should be recommended. So that's why we went with with the one to one and then a two to one. If it's when it's maturity, one of the reasons this is problematic is that oftentimes an arborist report will say you know, you've got five redwoods here and they are closer to one another than good horticultural practices would have them be. And that was fine when they were juvenile trees and somebody put them in along their fence line as a, a visual barrier, you know, but 15 years later or 20 years later, uh, they're not only threatening structures and whatnot, but they're threatening each other. And you can't tell a resident, you need to take a tree out because these trees are too crowded and oh, by the way, you have to put two more in. And that's why you have to have a subjective review of the request. 
and I would encourage residents when they get their arborist report to actually sort of tee up the replacement plan and have the arborist comment on the replacement plan as well. Uh, and that way you have a professional that says, you know, take one out over here and put one in over there. A lot of times the arborist will do an entire tree inventory for a resident when they give them a report. They'll tell them what every single thing growing in their property is and what its characteristics are. So I, and just a quick comment. I don't want to take into Paul's uh, comment. I, just, I think the in view fee is, is a critical component that covers that where if there's no place. Gives them another option. Another option. And then you can look at potentially more than one is to one because that goes into a tree fund, which can go to places which are lacking trees. That we and there's a sense of community too that can be developed by that. You yeah. know that you helped fund like that tree because of this replacement. I don't know if there's just um we have to look bigger picture, I just feel like, and um not limit it to that property. Yeah. No, maybe <laughs> that, that was that, that I was thought we just story, we yeah. wanted to Tell just it. focus on that topic. <laughs> okay. Um I guess the other this is a Question that's yeah, discussion or clarify. I'm not sure, but we specified a, a diameter for native. I'm just curious of why, why we need that or you know, why not keep that open to being just all natives knowing that we need to try to support our local ecosystem. Can you can you clarify that? Just so we, yeah, we're, we're saying, oh, if the, the native, if they're under 10 inch uh, diameter, I believe it is, then that's not protected. I just I wonder why why put any why allow for even yeah nascent native trees to to be not protected. Um, so it's protecting all native trees at a smaller size to encourage that there are more native trees. Right. Yeah, it's, but it's it, still it, all trees. It's smaller than the general uh, for protection. all trees. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm trying to raise the question about we shouldn't have a size limit for native, native. trees. That's native trees would be protected yeah. regardless of the size. Yes, the question would be then how far do you go? Like you know, an oak, you know, acorn falls, and then there's a tree that went there. There's 10 trees that grow under an oak. Uh -huh. At what right. point can you not take them out? Right? So, yes. Yeah. I guess the question would be should we consider recommending it to be a lower? You know, the 10 inches is what it's 32, right. it's going to be I mean, 32, right? In, in, so it's yeah. Yeah, that was something that I remember we kind of discussed with the um, the arborist, and when she was opining on it, is that it's there you're going to have some natives that I mean, kind of like she you know, was just mentioning, is like you know, a sapling that drops and it flourishes. and but there was no intention of that tree actually being there because sometimes natives will take off um, quite rapidly um, with not much tender love and care. But at the end of the day is that there needs to be some type of a realistic threshold of where is it, are you creating a loss of, of the actual tree in and of itself, any potential degradation to the actual soil, so you're going to you know create some type of um, Kind of unrest essentially from digging it up um and so that was based on you know the arborist recommendation um in I, regards to that yeah i didn't see many other cities who protected also was the only one i think that was at seven and a half in general i think there may be one or two that were at six but most most people are most jurisdictions seem to be 10 or 12 or Native trees. Yeah. native trees. 11, I think, yeah, Palo Alto is 11 yeah. inches for native trees. So we could consider, I mean, I mean know, 10 inches is not, not very big, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. Could be significant. Yeah, I did see Saratoga has six inches for native trees, mm -hmm. but that. I mean, we could, we could look into yeah. lowering the size. We, yeah, we could we try to go, you know, like make sure that smaller. we can still remove like tiny ones because they have to be removed. But I think once they That's reach a small. specific size, maybe we, we keep them and maybe 10 inches is too high for native trees. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think the arborist, what her explanation was, is that once you get to a certain size, then, I mean, the tree, you're, you're, you're cutting down the tree. You're not even potentially kind of taking it out and maybe moving it somewhere. Because some people do do that. I yeah. mean, I've done that in my personal life. <laughs> Very expensive citrus trees that I never want to have to move again. <laughs> uh, but with that being said, is I mean, it, again, if there's that was her thought process. I do remember that being a part is like, at that point, there's no path of like really truly making sure the tree is protected. You're not going to really be able to comfortably know that you're removing it from the ground and it's not going to potentially be impacted. It's really going to be a removal of the tree. Laura. I was just going to comment on, um, on the replacement piece of it. Um, I would think that you wouldn't have to, if you wanted to do a two to one replacement, you wouldn't have to necessarily put them in the same place the existing tree was. So I would think most of our lots are large enough that you, even if you did a two to run replacement, you could have it somewhere else on the lot. So you're not crowding. Um, maybe that's not feasible, but it is a potential. And then the other question I just had was about, um, is there any kind of qualification for um, arborist reports. I mean, who gets to decide if the health of the tree, because I know from experience, one arborist will say one thing and another will say something completely different. Yes. Um, yeah, so right now that we require an arborist report. Um, I don't believe there is a, we require a certified arborist. Um, in an arborist report with okay. our tree removal permit. Uh, I will say that we will be adding um, to our website a list of arborists, uh, of certified arborists, um, so that people can go to um, and have resources for that. Just to clarify for everyone, when you talk about certification, talk about International Society of Arboretal, Arbor Arbor specifically, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah, the ISA. Yeah. Yeah, which now it's not currently defined. It just says in our handout, you have to provide an arborist report, um, but there's nothing in our code that says it needs to be from a specific type of credentials. So, and there are actually, and that was something that um, the arborist did opine on is that we do need to create like a standard that you have to have this specific one. You can't just have one of the ones that you get, you know, with a 10 hour course online type right. of a deal. Cause she did say there are ones that are out there like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you have a lot of arborists yeah. that are employed by tree removing companies actually Correct. that have very yes. uh, lenient. Yes, that's for sure. So you don't want those. Yeah, so and, and they did recommend, you know, having an arborist even for the replacement uh, for, of the trees. Um, okay. But I think that would be an additional cost to the applicant at that point. All right, so I think um, on that particular size thing, maybe it would be worthwhile looking at a smaller size for the native trees. And I don't know what the size should be, um, but I think if some cities are doing five or six inches, I'm guessing you know that's a reasonable size, and it's actually a pretty, it's already a pretty big tree. I mean, canopy wise, it could be a pretty big tree actually. Yeah. The six inches. Yeah. In if, we could, if we could put that request in to yeah to push the the lower limit for the others. For the for the native for the trees. trees, yeah. So the if it's currently at ten, should we and do we need to request a propose a number or do we just say lower eight six? Yeah, we we'll let. I mean, I think in order, I think in order to be able to move it forward, you, if you guys feel comfortable with you know recommending that we you know consult with the arborist to be able to do um, a lower number of whatever they think is justifiable under best um, practices, that's fine. If you guys want to specify something super specific, just understand that we're going to consult with the arborist, and that'll be inevitably what gets. Um, for the city council um, next month. First thing, we're gonna, the first thing we're gonna ask you, Nick, is what you think is enforceable. Yes. Right? Yep. You could choose a six inch diameter, but if that's narrow enough that it allows residents to take trees out without anybody even knowing, if it's small enough that people can just sort of get away with taking a tree out in their backyard, that their neighbors won't even notice, then we won't have any way of enforcing it. So 
as much as I'd like to save every tree, we have to be practical and, 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 and pick a number that is enforceable. Yeah, and I only saw Saratoga having the six inches uh, and, and I did my research on um, Santa Clara County and a couple others, um, but they're not all one-to-one. -one. You know, some, some cities are only doing specific, protecting specific trees um, where we're doing all trees. And now we're adding the native species. So like we were saying earlier, it's usually 10, 11 for native, 12 for all trees. So, I mean, I think, I think my uh, sense of what the commission would like to see is if you could explore smaller size and I'll leave it to you to decide what the smaller size would look like. I don't know exactly, I'm not an arborist, so I'm not going to tell you what size it should be, but I think it would be good to take a look at that. Whether it's eight, whether it's six, I don't know what it is, but it would be nice to take a look at that. And the other question, I mean, actually I had a, another thing about this uh, 12 inches. Um, when you look at other cities, I just wanted to, uh, what, what are they using in terms of size right now, in terms of diameter? Diameter, is that 12? 12. 12. Uh, uh, Pretty much everybody across the board is what we're seeing. Um, so, Majority is using 12. Yeah, there are some still using 15. Um, Mountain View still uses 15. So 12 would be the lower limit of what other cities mm -hmm. are using right yeah. now. Um, East Palo Alto has 7.5 inches for all trees. Yeah. But I think it's like oh, circumference is 38, you said, right? So uh, my my recollection was that yeah, some cities were at 36. Yeah. 12 but, yeah. is kind of a good media number. Yeah. Did we, uh, Laura, did we address your, your comments? Uh, you had two comments from them. Um, yeah. Just yeah. wanted to make sure we had the discussion. We haven't gone to the discussion or the right. the replacement bit yet. Yeah, the replacement is another one that we need to look into. I think because I think the idea is, I guess we replace, we remove a tree. We want to replace it with one, two, three, four, whatever number of trees to try to come to to, you know, keep that size that originally was there in terms of carbon sequestration, in terms of shade in terms of you know, all these factors that are important, right? In terms, of, in the context of climate change, right? It's shade lowering the temperature, it's carbon sequestration. And we would like, if one tree is, re is removed, we would like it to be replaced by something that's equivalent, whether it's one tree or more trees, but we would want to try to be around there, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not comfortable with the, with the concept of one as to one at maturity, because um, that, yeah, like 20 could years, be, 25 years. Yeah. We have to consider the cost, you know, that whatever is under the curve, you know, over the curve of what you're not covering as your tree is growing. And that cannot be lost. So um, I feel like we should put a time limit to when that canopy needs to be re recovered. And then if we tie it back to our climate action plan where we want to enhance our canopy, then maybe we say, okay, if we have two is to one by 10 years, we will have enhanced our can canopy by 10%. So if we have some kind of a sense of, okay, we're not just taking down trees and hoping that in 50 years we'll have recovered it, um, that, but that in 15 years, we will, we will have, um, you know, grown our canopy by some amount. And again, in legacy cover takes over um, the trouble, the problem of planting too many trees in one place. It, it goes towards a fund where the city can then decide where to plant those trees and how to best care for them. I think I really want to push for increasing our canopy in a reasonable period of time and not going, trying to just catch up in 50 years. Yeah, so I can share what the, the arborist recommended in terms of a process, and you guys can let me know how you feel about that. Um, so the applicant would submit an application for a private protected tree removal, um, which would include the, uh, the documentation for the planner and preferably an arborist to review. 
the removal application materials and replacement plans would be evaluated for accuracy, et cetera, et cetera, and replacement value and other pertinent pieces of information. So um, they say that the replacement tree location should always be evaluated by an arborist based on the mature size of the tree and taking into account the above and below ground constraints. So then, you know, um, if in cases where no tree could be replaced on site, we, rec we recommend the applicant be required to pay into a public tree fund, which we already said, yes, that's a good idea. Um, and this would be used to plant trees on public property elsewhere in the, in the city. So if they're recommending that an arborist review the replacement plan, in, which I don't know if that would be an additional cost since they're already getting a certified arborist um, when they're applying for a tree removal permit. Well, I think you know, in general, I think uh, that's going back to what also Tony was making as a comment is that we want to limit the number of permits that are that are, that are requested to remove trees, right? So okay. we we want to make it expensive enough so that people are going to think twice about. It. So I think whatever the permit fee is, we can talk about that later, but whether it should be $250 or something else. But also, if there are additional, rec uh, uh, we're requesting additional things from the homeowner, like you need to get an arborist to give you a replacement plan, you need to get an arborist to make sure whatever. That's fine if it costs more money, because that's the whole point, right? We don't make it, we don't want to make it easy for people to remove trees, right? It's That's in general, we want to make it as difficult as possible to remove trees, unless, you know, like you said, it's a, it causes problem with the structure, it's a dead tree, whatever, which uh, in that case, it probably should be simplified, but I think that's the idea. So if the arborist was suggest, I mean, I think, you know, the additional cost that you said, it might be an additional cost for the property owner, that's mm -hmm. fine. I mean, I don't have any, any problem with that. I think it helps that they, they have an arborist to help them uh, about what tree, what kind of tree to plant, because there could be limitation uh, of the nutrient tree, you know, the, the underground and the in-ground. And so uh, if they work with a professional, it would be less problem 10 years, 15 years from now. I, I, I feel it's more educational component. Yeah, it would cost a little money, but you, you want to avoid because if the underground condition is not healthy, uh, you know, certain size tree just would not survive. Besides, mm -hmm. I think that our drought situation, I don't think it's going to be significantly improved. Um, the time that it's going to take them to mature, I think it's going to be longer. We have to prepare for that. So, um, I, so are we in agreement that I think the, I think the consensus is is that the the commission wants um, the arborist um, when there when there's a proposed removal that they also um, cite and justify like what the replacement um, schedule should be right. meeting though our basic criteria and I think what Rashina was mentioning is you know, if the commission wants to recommend two to one and they say it's really not feasible based on the root structure or whatever, you know, weird nuance, they might have a giant pool. So it might not even be, you know, actual plant materials that exist. It could actually be structures that are existing on the site. And if that is, then it could go into um, the city planting fund, which at the end of the day, that's a win for the city because I mean, we don't have thousands or millions of dollars to do a bunch of trees um, throughout town. And yeah. we that's another way for us to build somewhat of a, an ability to do that throughout the city. Um, so I think that's kind of what I think we even just know to kind of reconcile with the recommendation of the commission. Yeah, I think I think that's the right way to go. I think it's making sure that if you have an arborist that's going to recommend the removal of the tree, the arborist also should come up with a replacement strategy to make sure we were placing one to one, not one tree for one tree, but one to one in terms of what we're removing, whether it's one tree or several trees. And if it can't be done in the property, like you said, then it, they have to pay into a fund, mm -hmm. right? I think that makes sense. Are we, are we good with that? Yeah, that mm -hmm. makes sense. So the, um, one thing no, that- are you good? One thing that was brought up earlier about if there is a dead tree or if there's a truly dangerous tree, maybe the city can offer to waive the initial 
arborist report on removal of the tree, but mm -hmm. still request the replacement mm -hmm. arborist plan. So maybe that's one way of, because it's a lot of. Well, if it's a dead tree, I think the, the city could waive the permit fee. Yeah, I, 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 I would I say do. waive the permit fee because yeah. what I saw before yeah. the storms where there were a lot of sick and dead trees and people weren't removing. Uh, and obviously, the it storms, becomes a hazard. Right? Because yeah, well, we want some people to take that out. Those, but, uh, yeah, I, I, think, over I think right? it's. I think it's. Again, the principle of of wanting to replace every tree even if it's dead, right? Um, they, they should still have to replace it. I think, but they right, should have to yeah. pay a permit fee, maybe. That, that, that was all just to incent them to move quickly and get it done. Right. I, I don't know. We could talk about it. I feel strongly that that there should be some value associated. You take out the arborist requirement. That's if a permit fee is five hundred dollars, the arborist fee is a couple thousand dollars. So yeah, we can't we can't pay so, for that. Right. 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 So no, we can waive that as okay if your tree is you know, proven to be dead, whatever, but however, who's that's, making the, that's a good question. No, you have to have arborists, I think. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, so I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if there is a way to do it. We need, the, uh, the fee itself is a very small portion of taking the tree. No, no, I, I understand that. I, I just think anything you can do to some people take out dead trees or dying trees is good. And, uh, waving the permit fee is light. It doesn't really do anything except it just might motivate them a little. I can't think of anything else. Well, you're going to need an arborist report. You're, yeah. you're going to need something, so. You're going to have an arborist report. You're still going to need re your replacement plan. The only thing we can do potentially is to remove the permit fee for a dead tree. And I don't know if that makes sense from a city standpoint, but, and I'm not sure it's going to make a huge difference at the end of the day. So in terms ease, of the, the cost. ease of application, I wouldn't put that into the ordinance or a handout because then you're going to have every arborist say that it's dead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or that, or honestly, their big one is because I've looked at arborist reports and I'm like, well, if you read this paragraph, the tree's dead. But if you read this paragraph in the same report, it's they say, oh, no, it could be fine. And it's like, OK, well, the could be in the should or the shall. Like, yeah, it's right. it's a mishmash. So I, I wouldn't recommend that. Um, I mean, we do have the authority to waive when it's appropriate. For example, we had a very large pine tree um, just around the corner from City Hall, and it was dead. It looked like a fire hazard just walking by it. Um, there was no necessity to have a permit granted for that. I mean, it was just they needed to remove it. Um, and sometimes code enforcement will order you to remove it. So there's also not, <laughs> we're not going to say you need to take it down. Oh, yeah, also come and get a permit for it. So yeah. there's that component. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, I saw that usually. So you still need the arborist report. So you, you still need yeah. the replacement. Yeah. You, and then the city could, could have the so, discretion to wa waive the permit fee, maybe if there's an economic. You know, if someone says they can't afford it or whatever. So, sorry, mm -hmm. the city's requiring them. So, maybe that's. Aren't there situations when trees get taken out without a permit and without an arborist report? Yeah, when it's a public health hazard, it needs to come out. And you don't make that person get an arborist report and a replacement plan and, and, and any of those. Right? Those are things, correct me, please clarify. These are things that are required for taking out protected trees. These are things, if you have a tree that's a hazard, a nuisance, Public safety, it needs to go. And as a homeowner, you're not only within your rights to do it, but you're obligated to do it. Okay. Yeah, but does it doesn't necessarily preclude you from having a replacement strategy. Yeah, because you're taking out you're take, canopy. Yes, but it does. It does preclude you from being forced to have a replacement strategy because by law, you can't be forced to replace a tree that you have to take out because it's a hazard. But the replacement... We can only force people to replace trees when we are granting them a permit to take out a tree that we have protected in practical terms. In, in, in philosophical terms, I agree with you. We should replace every tree twice over. But, but, but in practical terms, I don't think yeah, we can. So, yeah, Nick, would you clarify when permits are required and when they're not? Yeah, so, I mean, so Council Member Daly is correct. Is so if someone does take it upon their own accord and some people do they know they have a dead or very dying tree that's not going to come back um anytime soon um i mean it is under their general obligation of um of the responsible party of real property that does have to actually take down the tree if they do it under essentially even under our existing ordinance under the emergency tree removal which does not need to be granted a permit there is no nexus for us to be able to require the permit. 
the only one nuance that I could ever say is, you know, the handful of folks that have come in that wanted to memorialize their emergency tree removal. And they're like, hey, we'll pay the $75 because we just don't, we know our neighbors are going to be pissed. Honestly, at the end of the day, we probably could have been like, okay, well, just please plant the same tree, you know, over again. That's probably the only way that we'd be able to do that because if they're doing an emergency removal, they're not emergency going to go and get uh, an arborist. I mean, that's just the practicality of of what the the removal would just, end up triggering. Just understand, so anybody can just remove a tree and say it was dying or it was a hazard. No, not no, not necessarily. So, I mean, we have had people that have tried that before, and just by virtue of the fact that neighbors, I mean, it's the neighborly thing to wrap your neighbor out, um, yeah. you know, on certain things. And so, you know, we've gotten pictures of like, no, that tree is not dead. Um, that's the one that I'm referencing about the thousand dollar um, fine that someone got because I went out on site and I, they're like, oh, it's dead. I'm like, Dude, these branches are not dead. I mean, the pine needles on the ground are dead, but the branches are not dead. So no, it's it's not as simple as that. But if someone can, for example, the tree that was down on San Antonio, I went out on site and for all extents and purposes driving by it, it looked fine. You actually walked up to it close and you actually saw how the trunk system was starting to split down the middle. So, you know, yeah, you can use the cable system that they had to do and you can assign the risk and liability to your own personal, you know, liability. But that's that's not every single case. And so they were able to remove it under an emergency waiver. Yeah, so, so yeah, go ahead. No, no, I was just wanting to close the loop. Yeah, that. I'm just trying to so if if there is a process for an emergency waiver, mm -hmm. I mean I think that's 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 good for the city to have that process. But if there is an after the fact, oh, it was, you know, without the city having first, mm -hmm. you know, overview any kind of um over oversight on it, then you get into the point of was it really an emergency or was it not? So, so long as there is a process for the city to say, okay, it's a phone call, you need to take down the street, do it ASAP. That's, I mean, so long as there is that. Mm -hmm. But I don't think if we allow residents to take down trees because they think it's dangerous, then it goes down the path of how do you, how do you, you know, enforce for others. Mm -hmm. So that's we have to be clear on that. Yeah, I, I think the emergency waiver one has, even as it's designed today, it provides the the clarity of you know that it's it's truly a dead and dying tree, and that the authority is to you know that you're granted it. Um, I think it's worked fine, and I don't think it's been overly abused. I think that's also one of the reasons why. Los Altos does very visually when you stand back from certain vantage points, we do have more trees than some of our surrounding cities. Whether you agree with that or not, it's we do have trees here. So <laughs> sorry guys, but that's the truth. <laughs> so we were we're talking about the dead tree removal process and not the, the criteria anymore, correct? Well, we're no. talking about the dead tree, right? So <laughs> it, was the, it doesn't even have to be a dead tree to be an emergency removal. Yeah, yeah. It could be a perfectly healthy tree, February, and, and a, a weather event can take a perfectly healthy tree and turn it into a public health hazard. Uh -huh. You know, oak trees are so huge and their canopies extend so far that if you have something happen to an oak tree where it loses one of its key uh, limbs and, and the weight of the tree is then altered and it becomes a threat to the structure that's on the side that didn't lose the limb. You know, there, there are things that happen to trees that, that uh, unfortunately, you know, probably the biggest risk to public health in this town is our, tre are our trees. So we not only have to encourage healthy new trees, but we do need to cull the ones that are, are I guess in between those two would be care for trees that might become problematic. It is if, if we go, in, if we go into culling, then we I really don't know how we can come with that. So, yeah. Sorry, we can. Uh, okay, so I, mean, I just want to kind of close that one because, um, so I mean, you try to come wrong. I think the idea in general is that if you remove a tree, whatever tree it is, Right, whether it's dead or not dead, or diseased or perfectly healthy or whatever, you want to be able to replace it with something that's equivalent to what it was. 
before we move. Right? I think that's that, that's what we want to do, right? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter what tree we're talking about. If it's removed, it has to be replaced. So if it's possible to replace it on that property, right? Then you then you request an exception. Mm -hmm. And you have an arbor saying, you know, we can't plant three trees to replace that one because there is no space for it. We can only plant two. That's an exception. You you agree or you don't agree with mm -hmm. it and you move on. But I think the idea is okay, remove a tree, whatever the tree is, you need to replace it with something that's equivalent. If the property allows it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was going a little bit further and okay. say that something that adds to the canopy in the next period of time. If, if we're, yeah, and, but, so that's but, where the two is to one maybe comes in if we're thinking about. Right. But um, I think the other point, if you can't do it, then you have to pay two yeah, before, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. That's, that's, that's mm -hmm. the, the thing. So either you replace it one to one, the equivalence being not one tree for one tree, but what the tree was provided for what the new tree would provide. And if you can't do it, then you pay into a public form mm -hmm. and that we can determine how much it is. But Yes, so that's basically what was on the slide we were talking about was a two to one, whether that's on the property, you're still covering for another tree, essentially outside of that property via, via well, you an, think, an extra fee or putting it on the property. Yeah. In addition to replacing. In addition to the one to one saying, oh, yeah. That's that's that. And that's something several cities have like two okay. to one. Three well, I don't know that. Yeah. I mean, so that's, I, that's at, a minimum, at a minimum, I think we should we should replace for sure now you know I, I think it's hard to ask for more but i think so, i think the arborist specifically stated that a one-to-one -one, they don't encourage a one-to-one -one replacement they they encourage replacement trees replacing trees with a larger canopy but not more trees so and then they say that you know the goal is a greater canopy cover in the short term so there's different method methodologies right. to do that, as I was stating earlier. Um, and that's why they said that it requires an arborist to create yeah, because, a replacement schedule. Because the point there is that when, when they talk about canopy, they talk about carbon sequestration and they talk about shade, right? So mm -hmm. it's the canopy replacement really that's the, the, the most yeah. important, right? Not necessarily the side of the trunk. Uh, and different types species of trees are gonna do more than one specific species of tree that's been removed because it's actually not sequestering that much carbon. If you take a palm tree out, it does nothing to carbon sequestration. It's one of the lowest species in terms of carbon sequestration. If you replace it with something that's gonna sequester a lot more carbon, mm -hmm. then the requirements are not the same. So, but anyway, without going to the detail, I think, I don't know if we want to go that way in terms of saying you replace one to one, but on top of that, you pay into a CD form. Um, uh, I would say my personal recommendation would say you do at least one to one. And if you can't do one to one for various reasons, technical reasons, um, then you're going to have to pay into the, 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 the public form. But, yeah, so and we can define what the fee is. The fee can be more than the fee for putting one more tree, it could be equivalent to putting two or three more trees, right? It could be you know, five hundred dollars the public form fee for that, and then that covers for two trees. Should cover for about two trees. The reason for considering more is looking ahead to the urban forest master plan as a very practical means to increase our canopy through yeah. our residents, and that's that's why I'm talking about this idea of two to one is because it's it's such a practical means to get that started. But I think that the other point makes sense to me is that some tree creates canopy larger and faster than some species. So it's not the quantity that defines that you're going to get a, a canopy you want. It's what type, what species, sure. you know, they're not, it's not quantity. Quantity doesn't determine that, right? So I think we need to have that criteria built in there. It's what type of species, how big a canopy and how fast can they grow? to the size of canopy, it matters. All right, I think, so, I think, okay, I think we should, just, maybe just one, one more and then after we need to close this. So what I, what I think if we want to get to that canopy, maybe we come back to by when, right? If we say we need to plant as enough trees to replace the canopy, say in 10 years, 
And if it's an oak tree that will grow whatever percentage, you know, you can, I mean, and that's the arborist can say, you know, this is the canopy of the mature tree. This is the canopy of the tree at 10 years. Then maybe you do need two trees to replace that one tree. If you have a fast growing tree that can grow within the water, whatever conditions where it's planted, that will meet that criteria in 10 years or some, you know, whatever. I think 10 years is reasonable because you're still not up to that canopy. You've taken out this much canopy and you planted a little one and you're growing there. So for the 10 years, you're not matching that canopy. So, but if you if you say, okay, in 10 years, you want to be able to match that canopy rather than that maturity, then maybe you'll need more. Yeah, I wouldn't do maturity because maturity yeah. is depends yeah. on the species and, it, and it's it not going anything. to work. So, uh, yeah. but I would, I would, yeah, and I, I would think more though it could be that. 50 years. So I think we, we have to quantify by when we need to replace that, uh, that canopy at the minimum and then plant as many trees as it will take based on the species and planting to meet that canopy. So is the commission okay with the, 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 the replacement um, is with um, that the canopy is um, achieved within 10 years? I mean, that's the number that just has been burned out a lot. Well, I just threw it out. I don't know if everyone else. I, I don't think you could request less than 10 years. It's going to be hard, okay. right? So, mm -hmm. right. Yeah. We have no time. <laughs> yes, but anyway. We have no so, time. No, I don't. It's the phone exit, yeah. central crisis. Well, we yeah. Got, yeah. I mean, yeah. So, I think we need to be realistic in some ways. Right? So, make it reasonable. So, replacement of the tree cannot be within a specific time frame. So I think. Some people would argue for less, but I think I understand that pretty much everybody is saying probably within 10 years. Right. I think, yeah, we'll, we'll, you we'll may, figure you out. Want to enter yeah, that we'll, we'll figure out how to incorporate something consistent with that into right. the, um, into the draft ordinance. Okay. Um, you wanted us to talk about the fee also, right? So that one I'm going to just somewhat steer is it's just based on whether or not the, I'm sure the commission wants to increase the rate. Um, the specific that I'm going to at least somewhat put you very specific into a little bit because fees are getting very, very um, legally regulated, even for basic things like trees. Obviously, I'm sure you all want to go above the current $75. Do you want to be at the county average or do you want to go above? Um, it's not for the commission to actually determine the exact number. I'm saying all this also is that we literally are doing a comprehensive fee study update, which is being analyzed by a third party consultant pursuant to um, AB 602. So realistically, even if we set it a little bit low, that's fine in eight months from now, it will get corrected um, and potentially increased if it warrants it. However, I we just have to be very delicate when we're trying to set new fees. Um, Palo Alto, for example, again, Charter City, they're not the same, so that's why they're the highest in the county. Um, so we just have to be careful when we're considering. Is Palo Alto included in the average, even though they're a charter? They're 400 Yeah, they're 400 bucks, so that would raise the average. There's, there's I, just, I did the every city in the county. Can we can like, be right above the median instead of looking at the average. Yeah. And and that if that. and that if that's the method that you guys want to use is you know obviously most people use average for a lot of different numbers in city government but if it's the median that you guys want to use you right. can use that. I the the, would the that number higher. yeah the number looks to me I think when Tanya presented it looks like median B would be close because a lot of it fall between like a two fifty to two seventy five. Yeah, there are some that be a little bit lower. So I think. Well, if you take the two extremes it's, out, yeah, it's, one, it's not like some the same cities one fifty and yes. the other one's five hundred. The so other, the other thought was there are several cities that updated their tree ordinance, uh, tree protection ordinances, and then there's several that have not. So if you take the ones only that have updated them in the last five years. Yeah, we come up with a different number. I mean, I, I frankly, my it's it's very subjective, but I think two fifty seems reasonably low. That's but it's very subjective. Right? You 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 came up with something that's kind of trying to be objective. Uh, but I would say it feels low. I mean, two hundred fifty dollars uh, for most people building or removing trees in Los Santos is probably not that much money. So I would say I would be in favor of increasing that fee. And again, going back to what Director Zorns was saying, 
you know, they can decide what that fee should yeah. be. Right. But you, would you yeah. be okay with that? Yeah, yeah. 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 Palo Alto has a really high fee because they have a whole urban protection, uh, urban forest protection. I don't know if it's a division or a team. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. why they can do that, but we we don't have that. But this um, is uh, th this permit fee is just. It's, it's not just one tree, right? It could be three trees. Yeah, that was the other question. So, the, so that could be a part of your recommendation. Yeah, is that it's um, that this is. I would actually probably recommend that it's per tree. Yes, um, okay. not per site. Mm -hmm. Some cities we'd have to honestly dig in probably a little bit deeper even. Um, so you could do that as just as part of the, is that the permit be is the average you know um, per tree because I mean when you count like between all of these that are up there within a $20 spread, there's five that are at like the 250 mark. So realistically, that kind of is obviously somewhat of a sweet spot. So we'll have to look at it specifically with our um, fee update um, for everything. But um, I mean, we just also have to look at too is that, um, and this, this, it's always the, it's the, it's the, it's the carrot of the stick, however you want to do it is when we're at the the rate that we're at, we're already gonna be increasing over 300% um, by doing 250. So again, you have to somewhat stage it and stagger the increases. Otherwise it's gonna create more conflict than benefits. And it does happen quite quickly to be able to do it by uh, next year. So, so I would recommend one, uh, one fee per tree. Yes, I would agree with that. And then I would recommend that we could go around to be higher than the average. Whatever that happens. And it could be defined yeah. by you. Right. Yeah, I agree with that. Sorry, it was one fee per tree. And yeah. Then... And then above 250, but like we don't define the above 250. It's up to you to come up with a something that's reasonable you think is doable from a legal standpoint or a fee standpoint okay um laura are you okay with that yes okay i'll tell you further okay <laughs> uh, <laughs> um i think uh okay. what what about the uh the in lieu fee of one thousand yeah. dollars we briefly had a discussion about uh, we had clarified question about that is there but anything the, we should talk no, about that's penalty that's the penalty for yeah, yeah, no, I understand. Fee, right? okay. Do you have the inland fee will be a admin like a set fee. Yeah. But that will be determined based on what it costs to find a place, plant a tree, care for it over a certain period of time. Let's see. I mean, I'd I'd have to look at um what the arborist kind of referenced. And that part we obviously, you know, the fee kind of components the easiest part of all of this process that we've been going yeah. through, honestly. Um, so I mean that can be something that we set is I mean, a lot of places don't do in Luffy's for certain for, for a variety of different types of projects or permits because it's just the, I'm more so saying that not specific to trees, just in general, because you don't want the in lieu, you want people to be planting the tree. So that that's just a that's a mindset sure. change. Um, so we'll just have to look at that and just have that as a part of you know what's a a suitable um, you know kind of planting um, cost. And we can check with the neighboring cities several times. Right. Yeah, I I checked with some of them and they do just a set fee. So our, I mean I know we we there's not an option for proposing to rate, make it higher the penalty, but just for the record, our penalty is much lower, would be lower even at a thousand than several cities around us. So that's, I mean, I'm just saying that we're not putting undue burden on on the citizens compared to. So but the question, if we, if we, do we have limitations around that? Um, legally, we will not be able to do yeah, it. Yeah, so we're not, okay. Yeah, so that's, that's what it is. Yeah, it's, so it's, a, it's, we've it's the financial burden that I yeah. think Bruce has yeah. kind of the, the mentioning. It's just the legality um, that it's not something the city yeah. would support. Yeah. So there would okay. be there would be that one thousand dollar whatever it is plus the uh, media fee, right? In addition, <laughs> which has to be defined. But mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Um, other things to discuss to review. Um, 
I'm, I'm going back to section three of the, the new removal criteria about defining utility public transportation as one of way of public, public infrastructure. Again, you know, um, if you're telling me that you will look at it on a case by case basis, uh -huh. uh, I think that's fine. And we probably don't have to define it. If, if there is a if there is a need to define it a little bit further, I think we can all also try to define it a little bit more. But you know, it's again, it's if you if you think you if you feel more comfortable than the way it is, uh, and you're telling us that you're gonna be looking at it on a case by case basis, I think we probably would be okay with that unless there are some people that are not comfortable with that. Well, isn't the issue that somebody uh, would just point to the written law? Like, so it says I can remove a tree if it's uh, interfering, with my, interfering with my utility line. It was interfering with my utility line, so I pulled it down. No, so that's, so again, that's where we're kind of commingling the, um, the emergency, just like that they're just taking it down. The, the emergency one is that it, honestly, the way that it's right now is that it would cause, um, Imminent um, threat to life or property. No, I'm not, I'm, I'm just talking about with respect to this specific term. And they, they, if you denied them a permit, they would just protest and say, "Look, it, it's very clearly stated in your rules." They would have to. Change. They would have to. Well, so no, so they wouldn't. Well, they wouldn't be able to um, appeal the decision. The appeal or the the authority of a ministerial permit in the city of Los Altos is final action. There is no legal, unless they want to go to court over it, which that would be a fun one. Um, but realistically, there's there's no appeal. They could apply for it again, and we could then hash it out all over again. Um, but, and then if they decided to just take it down, then they would get slapped with the $1,000 fine, essentially. Okay. Yeah, that's that's how it would work. Plus the cost of a permit, plus, plus being forced to do replacement. Yep. Okay, makes sense. Okay, so so we okay with not defining it further. You good with that? You good with that? There's no team. Okay, so I was I'm just gonna summarize yeah. the changes. Um, so we want to lower the diameter or the circum slash circumference of a native species. We want to look into that. And then we want to um, do a one fee per tree above 250. That's defined by or defined an amount defined by staff. And then we want to um, for the replacement schedule, we want to in the ordinance have what was shown in the PowerPoint but also include a certified arborist report that will that will outline a schedule for replacement. Right. So the idea is one to one kind of PYs within 10 years. That's really mm -hmm. what we do. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's certified by an arborist that recommends the trees to be planted to be able to get us there in 10 years. Yeah, I, I have it broken down yeah. as the, the arborist to provide recommendation on replacement and then the tree canopy be achieved within 10 years. Obviously, if that can't happen, then it would be something greater than a um, one to one. It would probably end up being the two to one yeah. that everyone's discussing. Yeah. Whatever it takes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then if they, for, for technical reason, they can't do it, then they would pay to the fall. Correct. Right. Uh, all right. So, so those, that, I think that's it. Okay. Okay. And so, then the utility stuff, we talked about that. Um, so I'm going back to number five again. Um, preservation of the tree would impede or significantly limit the use of real property. So how do we define that? I mean, what does it mean really? I mean, I, you know, if I'm an owner, as, an, as, as, as the owner of the property, I'm looking at that, I'm saying, well, okay. it limits the use or impedes the use of my property. Because what if, because, uh, I can't access the corner of my backyard, which is whatever. I mean, how do we look into that and say, well, you can't do it because it doesn't really have a huge impact on your, the use of your property. I mean, I, I just, I'm just worried that this section number five is a bit kind of like open to interpretation. Um, so in act, actual application, really like the one that comes to mind, um, 
is that there's a very large tree in the middle of the backyard and there's really no way to build, you know, an, an average size swimming pool um, for better or for worse, whether or not those should exist or not. Yeah. Um, but uh, that that's really kind of what is generally what is the most frequent one that would be used. Or if there's um, uh, an ADU that gets built or needs or is proposed to get built in the backyard. Um, and that realistically, just for practicality purposes, is that the trees have to be removed in order to be able to um, suitably site the um, the ADU in the rear yard. Um, so that's really what it is. I mean, that's just the that's how it's been applied um, okay. regularly. So it's pretty rigorous stuff. the way you do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean the the definition of like what you said. Um, actually, I was in a former council member's backyard and their neighbor was saying something similar. It's like, oh, well, I can't really get to that tree. I'm like, well, that's not really an excuse to get rid of your tree. Right. Um, and so that, that's what ended up happening is they, they did not get to remove that tree. Okay, so. I'm sorry, they didn't get removed because? I'm sorry? They didn't get removed because? Because they, they were just saying that it's like, oh, I just can't access it. And because it was just in the back corner, yeah. like behind other trees. And it was like, well, yeah. probably just need to clean up the other trees. And so you can, clean it up so you do your timid arbitrator on that kind of yeah thing. yeah and staff um so like the planning um the planning technician that's in uh the development services department um prior to her arrival no staff would not go out regularly but if we cannot tell from either the arborist report or whether or not it's even photographs that have been provided to the city she does go out on site regularly weekly to be able to view the um the permits that she's being reviewed. I also do want to further, though, kind of reiterate that staff really does just a phenomenal job. We actually have a registered landscape architect on staff. So anytime someone says that, that we don't know what we're doing when it comes to the trees or landscape projects that we have in town, um, not 100% accurate because uh, <laughs> both of those staff members are phenomenal what they're doing uh, for the city in protecting trees and specifically also um, the water efficiency ordinance for landscaping and also making sure that things are designed um, with all of the other ordinances. So I just want to do a time check. It's close to nine and we're only on the I know. first. I know. It should go faster. Yeah, so, sorry. Yeah, so, sorry. Yeah, so, sorry. Yeah, no, I knew yeah, this one would be a long We all knew that. So, okay, that's fine. Actually, can I make okay. a comment on that? I'm, I am blown away how we spent almost two hours top talking about this. I, you know, typically in the past, this has been the level of detail that have been, has been discussed in subcommittees, and then the subcommittee works out all these details and comes to the commission with more of a full-fledged, fully formed recommendation. And I'm 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 curious and confused as to why that it is not happening to the same level that and and it seems inefficient to me to have the entire commission discussing this level of detail on a proposed ordinance agree i guess as chair of the subcommittee i would i would i would agree we we've had very limited meetings on this subject and i don't think the subcommittee the subcommittee has not i haven't seen the final proposals that were presented today so that's the reason we're having to have this discussion here. Yeah, About we this. did have a meeting with Tanya. Yeah, well, we, we had a meeting. That final proposal. Yeah, this was not, the final. We right. did not remember. Yeah, right. I think so. That's just I know. a different way that the city and the right. committees have been functioning until we have proper guidance. So that's right. That's why it's being discussed here. Yeah, we we've, we've seen some change. I think we met frequently last summer, and. Uh, yeah, um, I I, I, th I think a, you know I think we're not going to talk about some no, today. That's not that's not the venue and that's not the time. I think that's something that will have to be taken with the council specifically, probably at some point. But uh, obviously, uh, from experience, we all know that working through subcommittees and hashing out details through subcommittees is more efficient than trying to have the whole commission try to hash out details. It allows us to focus on the essential. Uh, but that's another that's an aside. Um, we're not going to go into that today. But I will just say that we did run the same PowerPoint by the subcommittee, and all these recommendations, recommendations, the twelve inches, all that were provided. Um, the, this feedback was provided by the sub subcommittee, um, in in us moving forward. So we were hoping that we would come today and present these recommendations, and that. Um, 
you know, there would be clarifying questions and, and discussion, but this is what we were hoping to put forward. And I guess as a matter of uh, procedure, was this presentation supposed to be in the packet that people had an opportunity to review? No, is that not? No, we don't. We don't. That? Yeah, we really. Sh I know that that's been the there's been inconsistency, be but yeah. we we were not supposed to or be required to okay. post um, PowerPoints because PowerPoint should be iterative until essentially she hits share screen. Okay. So, okay. yeah, um, it's. I think it's okay if we take two hours to discuss this because it's an important subject. I think if, you know we've if, been you know it's been a couple of years in the making, so. I think in general, if, if uh, as an aside, uh, if there are two ways of functioning, right? One, if we work mostly through subcommittees, and when it comes to the to the commission, the whole commission, it goes fast because the subcommittees made recommendation that's been working together with staff to come up with what they believe is going to be right for the commission. Uh, or we we work through commissions, but then the commission meetings like they're going to be extremely long meetings and somewhat painful. But that's the choice that has to be made at the city level. That's not our choice, obviously, but unfortunately. But that's the way it is. Our preference probably would be to work through subcommittees and hash out details through subcommittees rather than trying to do it at the commission meeting. I think we'd be more efficient. But all right, so I think we're done with the tree protection ordinance, unless there are any other things that we need to discuss. We do need to make a motion to, to make a so if someone wants to. Could you repeat uh, for <laughs> us to make the motion? Yes, yeah, so we want to put forward, so the commission uh, wants to put forward uh, these policy recommendations with the changes of um, changing the protection of native species to a lower di diameter after conferring with the arborist, um, a one fee per tree, and um, a set, uh, an increased amount um, tree, tree removal fee um, based on what staff uh, puts forward, and then a tree canopy replacement of one to one or two to one, whatever it takes to get a tree canopy to um, increase in the next two, 10 years. To get to an um, equivalent canopy to, over the next the following 10 years. Yeah. To get to an equivalent canopy in 10 years um, that we are going to also confer with the arborist on. So I guess we can just say, so, make a motion with those changes. To then be for the staff to make the proposal to go to, directly to council. Yes. Yeah. This the council expects this. This has been in the making since I actually arrived at the city, and um, this ordinance, for all extents and purposes, it needs to move forward. So with staff will be making the changes. It will not return to the commission. Right. And then uh, is there an option before? Sorry. Um. To to have it. Uh. You know, have one one more review with the subcommittee. Um, I think that's depending on exactly when it's tracking to go to council. Um, I'll have to talk to Tanya about that and she might be able to quickly meet, but if it's, if it becomes a scheduling um, nightmare, then no. <laughs> so yeah, some committee is more flexible on that stuff. Right? So it's, they should be available pretty quick. If you guys can make it, they probably can make it. <laughs> I think in general, that's the way. Um, okay. So, and then the tree list. Is being updated and will be part of will be including in the ordinance, or it's going to be an addendum to the ordinance. So, um, so like we're native species, and then we'll... so that no, the native species is that's there's a prescribed list. Right. Um, I mean, it's not even really something the arborist still pines on. It's it's based on the essentially the collective um, whatever source it is. I can't remember the name off the top of my head. Yeah. Um, and then our street tree one is after consultation with our street. Um, or our tree um, guy here at the city, Ron, um, as well as then just knowing what has worked for us in the past, that is, I mean, very much locked in place. And then the the private property one was essentially an expansion of that list. Um, then with though some, you know, but keeping in mind the water usage component, which was probably the one thing that the arborist didn't like for me because I had slashed them off that were even just medium to low because I was like no we need just low <laughs> um, for water usage and so we that list is pretty specific there's not um there's not as many as you would think 
for um, trees that are supposed to be in our area. And that's a big part of what she created. So I, I, I just have one more thing I wanted to just point out. Number one, um, the trees that in poor health, the poor health being designed as a risk rating of moderate, high, or extreme. Um, so why do we include moderate in there? It Where seems to me like uh, new tree removal criteria number one, the tree is dead in poor health oh. or has a risk rating of moderate, high, or extreme. Um, so why do we include moderate? Why would a moderate not be a tree removal criteria? I mean, we, I mean, assuming you have low, moderate, high, and extreme, I would say high or extreme would be enough probably without having moderate. Well, it's it's because it's which cannot be moderate or uh, mitigated. So I mean, it's just low is the is the threshold that doesn't require any mitigation, and then anything above that you can either mitigate or it's going to be beyond essentially repair. Right. So moderate, I would guess, could be mitigated, right? Most likely, yeah. But you also it also depends on the specific tree. Okay, so moderate, which cannot be mitigated, meaning most moderate risk assessments will be actually won't, won't call for a tree removal because it can be mitigated, so do you say? Yeah, potentially. But again, that's that's also up to the arborist report, though, if depending on what what's getting proposed. We don't really, the ones that we see that, just so everyone understands, is trees that are coming in that are people saying dead or dying. I mean, generally speaking, the ones that they're, when they're coming in and asking us, it's like, I mean, the tree from head to toe has right. been brown. I mean, like where it's, I mean, you can tell the the thing is beyond dying. Um, so when it's the moderate ones, that's a little bit different. And then it's more so, no, you need to just look at the health assessment of it. And then that's usually when they work with either city staff for some recommendations or even they get the arborists and, or they just don't come back and talk until I guess it probably gets worse, but that's that's kind of up to them. When it's in the in-between, it's hard to kind of force them into one way or another. Okay. All right, so I, I just, that this was more of a question um, and I don't know if it should stay there or be removed, um, but I think that we have any uh, feelings about that. I have not an arborist well called the arborist. Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. exactly. So it's just, it's very hard. These are created by the arborist. Yeah, well, they're ready, kept it in there. Okay, all right. Okay, so we don't touch that. That's going to be okay. So going back to your motion, I think we got it. <laughs> Who wants to make the uh, uh, motion to what, to vote to approve to approve what uh, Tanya what Tanya just said? Yes. <laughs> Wait, may I make a friendly number? Yes. That's how it is with the recommendation that um, if time permits, uh, have a review with the subcommittee. Yeah. Before it goes to council. Before it goes yeah. to council. Okay. All right. Okay. The second. I'll take a. Okay. I'll take a vote. Um, Chair Delamu. Yes. Vice Chair Hecht. Yes. Commissioner Liu. Yes. Commissioner Van Rees. Yes. Commissioner Mayan. Yes. Commissioner Texler. Yes. Okay. Motion passes with um, amendments. Okay, thank you very much, Tanya. Let's thank move you. on to the next <laughs> one. <laughs> that was a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, let's move on to the M1 though. So um, just as a way of background, we had talked about at the last meeting, 10 June, if you remember, of course, who was the meeting, I don't know if someone else It doesn't matter. Um, we had talked about the issue that when Wendo was not, when the water event was not planning to finalize the M1 until 2025. It became an issue for us. The issue being, do we move forward with us? Well, we want water efficiency uh, ordinance, or do we just leave it and wait for the update on the window? So, uh, that being said, we had further discussion. I wanted to uh, give Tanya a chance to talk about that discussion, the, the commission to review that. Okay. Uh, so, last meeting, I think the request was that we go back and, you know, um, get gather our data and um, confer with other cities. So we we went ahead and did that, and um, and I've, I've mentioned this before in previous meetings, but Valley Water 
did confirm with us that no other cities have adopted um, this ordinance in parts or whole. Um, and uh, based on our research, a lot of these within the ordinance, there's about 17 measures. Um, most of them are already covered uh, through our ordinance. Um, the building, uh, the building requirements, um, or MLILO. And I, I attached that table in the agenda. Um, you know, I, I've been speaking to other cities uh, and they have confirmed what Valley Water has said. Some cities haven't even heard of M1 Doe yet or, you know, um, don't know what it is. So our recommendation being that Valley Water has told, it, told us that in the next triennial update is that we wait to reassess some of these measures um, during that time because it makes sense that if they are going to be doing that, they're going to be putting you know, their resources into doing that, that we also um, take advantage of that. Um, after looking at the measures that need to be um, reviewed, um, you know, it's measure one, hot water waste reduction, um, cooling towers, which, you know, after speaking to the building official, that sounds like it's something that's, um, it's more, yeah, it, it's addressing um, bigger buildings, um, mo mostly buildings we don't have here. And um, it would need to be paired with other requirements to be cost-effective. Um, so a lot of these requirements weren't proven to be cost effective in um, in the uh, uh, noted in the notes as well. So that is our recommendation that we're putting forth to the Environmental Commission. Um, and you, you have the chance to discuss, ask clarifying questions, and um, and then we would hope to make a motion to also go back to council and give them an update since this did come from council. Questions, clarification. Um, I, I just, there was a mistake on the um, table for faucets. It says the same note as the toilet flashing. I mean, automatic faucets may be preferred for health. It says automatic flush oh, toilets sorry. may be preferred. Yeah. So I'm assuming that the faucet not, note yeah. is the same, that there's some justification about health and sanitation, or I don't know, with automatic faucets. Correct. So the same justification, just sorry. Um, it should be automatic faucets may be preferred for health and sanitation reasons. The automatic faucet may be preferred, you say? Or no, I'm not preferred actually. Manual process, right? Yes, manual. Sorry. You want people to wash their hands for yes, thank you. It's a big amount of time. All right. So here's how building co. I know that it does. Sorry, no, 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 no. I'm I'm getting confused. Automatic is preferred for sanitation reasons. All right. Then I think the Moendo says you can't have automatic because the idea is that they break and then they waste more water. Right. But you're right. The justification here is you actually might want them because there's a health and safety benefit of not having to touch the faucet. Correct. Correct. Yes. So the M window prohibits the automatic flush toilets. Okay. So they are really one, two, three looking at the number three measures right that would be in m1 though that is not either something we would not recommend for some reasons or the reasons or is already done by the city so only to, we're talking only about action cooling towers mm -hmm. and commercial kitchen equipment that's that's and, yeah and the cooling towers honestly that that is predominantly something we see in commercial or non-residential right. land uses. So we we have very little of that in town. And even then the stuff that we do have, it's 
generally small in scale. Right. I live next to Intel, essentially type of a deal. So, yeah. um, you know, that's that's the type of thing that you see. Um, right. And most of those are already done by the city. Right? Oh, well, yeah. or yeah, or there, or the, or there, the Wheelo um, rules um, that already are in effect. Yeah. So the recommendation from staff, if, uh, if, if you don't have any other questions or clarification around this, I think the recommendation from staff is just to go back to council and say we're not going to do an ordinance based on the window until the next cycle in 2025. And I guess. The, the, the correlation to that is to say, you know, once once it's come out, we can move quickly also, right? Mm -hmm. right? So because yeah. we've done a lot of work already. I do touching. just want to share with the commission, though, because it was something that was initially brought up from council, and it was something that was actually brought up to me when I very first got here. And then I, I actually peeled back a lot of the layers of it. The initial thought, and there was a misconception of the actual, that this, us doing this would then allow for us to, or easier to do, but we do not have the CIP funding to do purple pipe in this city. Um, that's There was a very big miscommunication and misunderstanding that this ordinance and purple pipe would essentially just happen if we did this through. I don't know if maybe that there was a carrot um, dangled at one time, you know, at the regional level that if you did the ordinance, you'd be open to all this funding type of a source. Mm -hmm. That's not a part of the equation. I've had extensive conversations with Valley Water and other of our surrounding cities, like Mountain View, for example. The only reason why they did it through most of the city is because of Google paid for a big lump sum of it. Um, so that's that's a partly there's a little indication as to why it was necessarily pushed for M window specifically, um, as well as and obviously to do certain things, um, you know, obviously for the efficiency component. So um, with that, is the commission then okay with us reporting back to the council that it's something that we're going to defer until the update from Valley Water is, you know, on the yeah, I, I think there are things near can, term. There are things more water efficient, quote quote, than just doing a window, frankly. Um, but that's another discussion for another time. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, so um, if there are no more questions and clarifications, unless you want to have further discussions around that, I would say. We can move and make a motion. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, it's public comment. If we have any yeah, there is none, yeah. There is a <laughs> I would say uh, we can make a motion to approve staff's recommendations to defer working on M window and an ordinance based on M window until the next cycle, which is 2025, mm -hmm. once it's going to be updated by uh, the valid, uh, water, uh, water yeah. valid district. Um, so I make the motion. Um, okay, I'll take a vote. Chair Delegue? Yes. Uh, Vice Chair Hecht? Yes. Commissioner Liu? Yes. Commissioner Van Rees? Yes. Commissioner Mayan? Yes. Commissioner Texler? Yes. Okay. Motion passes. All right. Thank you very much. Um, um, okay, one that may take a little bit of time to, uh, so we, we're going to move on to the commission work plan. Um, and I just wanted to provide a little bit of background. We've, we've already approved the work plan as a commission back in mm -hmm. April or May, because we were trying to get ready to go in front of council. Uh, for our annual, annual meeting so that council could review the work plan and approve the work plan, so that therefore, uh, but that didn't happen. Um, and uh, now we had, uh, and we really haven't done anything with the work plan. So there are a couple of things that I wanted to have you review. First, um, because of what's happening right now with staff, Casey out, even though we may have someone in September, it's gonna take a while to, Find that person, we're going to be limited in the number of things we're going to be able to do. There is a funding issue. There are some things that should be funded already in the in the city budget. There's some that may not. So I've spent some so director zones to look at the work plan we have and try to layer it and prioritize some actions for immediate action and some other ones 
we could leave for um, because they could be dependent on funding or because they're not as high priorities, we could potentially wait to see what we can do first before moving on to the following one. So the idea is we could prioritize maybe four or five actions, try to get them done. Or if we get funding for another one, that's what that in the priorities, then it move up the list and so on. I have some flexibility in terms of the work plan, and we can take a look at that on an ongoing basis at commission meetings. So with that being said, as a kind of an introduction, I let uh, Tanya uh, talk about what we have now in the work plan. Okay. So what I put in the agenda, agenda attachments is, um, you know, the tree protection is now going to move to council. So it's off the environmental commission's plate. Um, and we just decided that also M window um, is going to be put on parcel um, later to another year. So we're currently working on the fleet electrification planning um, with SVCE. So our thought process was to move that up to number six, um, and they will essentially provide um, their report and um, identify and they'll identify funding, um, but we will have to go and apply for the funding and um, that is how we would be able to move forward with getting any city uh, fleet EVs or um, EV infrastructure. And so that's why it's moved up to number one. And number two, we've already started to do some work on that as well. Um, and then for, I'm gonna skip number two for a second. And then number, previously number four was a single use plastics ordinance. Um, but that was moved up because that is mostly city staff time, um, doesn't require any initial funding to get that started. And um, uh, so that could potentially be moved up even to number two. Um, that is something we'd like to discuss with the commission. And then three is also, you know, grant dependent, 3A and 3B. Uh, well, 3B was um, budgeted for it, something that can can be moved up. Um, and then the other items we had as an A, get to them after the priority items. So today, essentially, we want to hone in on, you know, this prior, this prioritization, and um, if the commission agrees, and then if we do want to move forward with this and take it to council. So can you need to clarify any of you know, the way yeah, that so, we organize this, but. I think it's it's good to open the floor for questions and clarification around that. Obviously there is some, a lot of pieces in there and some definition that needs to be clarified, but uh, so I'm going, just going to do that, open it up, have you ask questions and clarification and around what they're proposing. So basically what they're proposing uh, or what we're proposing is grading city operations, A and B would be top, uh, Single-use plastics uh, would be potentially second mm -hmm. or third right now. Um, and then uh, accelerating building electrification would be the next top one on the list, right? That's what we would be really focusing on right now. And unless we can remove some of those and move them towards council, then we go down the list. That's the idea. Um, couple of things that I wanted to clarify also, she mentioned, uh, Tanya mentioned the work with SVCE around electrification plan, building energy audits. We had some initial contacts with their technical assistance program. We have all the information we need to move forward. So and that's something that doesn't cost other than staff time that doesn't cost money to the city until you go into the process of, you know, upgrading your building so that they are obviously efficient. Uh, Single-use plastics, it's mostly an outreach at this stage because we kind of know what we want. Yeah. Um, and then uh, the building electrification, that's things we've talked about, right, in terms of bringing in consultants or people that provide services to help us accelerate building electrification in the city. Uh, all right, so I, that being said, I, I open the floor questions and discussion just on the process of this this was prepared with discussions with you three yeah okay. pretty much the, the three of us yeah. and then does it align with the cap and our priorities in the caps yes. okay 
Yeah, I mean, it's basically what we had discussed in June. Yeah, uh, no, it's, 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 April, it's, April, it's, April, it's, it was like right? back in April. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and that was taken out of the cap and based on okay. the priorities. Yeah, that, that's like, yeah, yeah. So, so it's, this is it's the just, same stuff. It's the same stuff, okay. except it's kind of reprioritized. It's been a while. Yeah, yeah. There is nothing and, new in there yeah. added or removed, except for the tree protection ordinance yeah, and the water right. so, yeah. so we've discussed today. One thing I'm going to at least just kind of throw out there like thought process and because me and Tanya talked about it a little bit before um obviously during and then even after because then we all yeah we, we got an email back and forth about stuff so one of the things so i i actually just just even to inform the commission i just spent a week long immersion from 8 a.m to 8 p.m for a week at stanford at the school of energy and it was the summer local institute for summer um for government leadership and it was all centered around obviously with climate change essentially um and so one of the biggest things that they you know really kind of focused in on is and this was actually from one of the commissioners of the cec who came in and talked it's about leveraging the funding that's available at the time and when it is so like what the um, commissioner just mentioned about does it align with our cap it might not explicitly align year to year one year might have to get pushed just a little bit more because if we can get a multi-million dollar something that is you know not maybe the urban forest master plan but it's going to be um, a master ev deployment i mean i think we all know which one's probably going to be more advantageous for us because it's just one of those things that, you know, when the money is available and we'll never be able to control that. And so that's also partly where I wanted to somewhat, why I wanted to even be here tonight is to also remind the commission is one of the jobs of, um, or tasks of Tanya and Keith is that they are also supposed to be our grant administrators for the city in regards to going after these grants, which I think we all know they're extremely cumbersome. You know, SVC is great for the ones that we get from them. It's like, you know, you throw your name in the hat and, you know, because we're a member agency, it's it's kind of easy, but it's not always going to be like that because the big dollars really are coming from the feds um, or from the CEC directly. And that was one of the things that we even talked about with the CEC commissioner, um, commissioners in the last year was just about like the, the competitive bidding process for it, even at the state level. It's sometimes, you know, overly cumbersome for stuff that it's like, Okay, we've already we're already in your system. How can we kind of somewhat streamline that? But she even said we're years away from that. Like we just need to hear what do you guys need money for? And their their method to their madness is to just create a new program that's almost so specific that it's almost a grant specific to the agency that talks to them about it. Um, so it it was a really great learning experience, but it was really good to kind of hear that because I mean, yeah, you know it, but you kind of get away from it when we're in the weeds of doing these things. And knowing that I would be taking the EC back into my portfolio, I was like, okay, that's actually a really good thing is hearing it from the horse's mouth, essentially, that we have to be able to remember is that, yes, we're on something, but it's all about that pivot. And if there's money to be had, we need to go after it in the moment because it's going to be something for I mean, Los Altos is yes, affluent in a very high price per square foot when house turn, but at the end of the day, you know, the city is a city and we're a small agency. So we do have to be able to also leverage the funding sources to be able to make the biggest bang for the buck in order to truly do it. Uh, that's why I was also wanting to also at least, you know, really make sure that the EC was understanding or even informed of, you know, the fleet electrification planning, you know, Councilor Maynard Daly's here and he was actually talking about this actually, um, when we just had to go and approve um, the purchase of a new, um, there's no option. And but right now, we were it's twofold. There was no option when we did a did it. Um, I think four months ago, um, because there literally wasn't the vehicles available to purchase EVs. Um, but then at the end of the day, we don't have the infrastructure. And I think we all know is no one's going to buy an EV unless you have somewhere to charge it. And our fleet is no different as we have to be able to create the mechanism to be able to have that on site. Um, PD is a little bit specific because they have to have private to the public EV infrastructure because of the way that it's required by law for their vehicles to be locked up. Um, but I just wanted to kind of somewhat bring all that, you know, up to the forefront is because I think this is a really good strategy that Bruno and Tanya really kind of helped to kind of finesse, but realistically just to be able to somewhat 
point out what are some of the things that we are doing. Um, you know, like the single use plastic thing, yes, there's still some outreach to be done, but an ordinance previously elsewhere. And, you know, as much as we all want to reinvent the wheel sometimes, like that's an easy win that we can get into effect and start implementing sooner rather than later. Um, I mean, that should be able to be done by the end of the year. Absolutely no, <laughs> no challenge or harm with that. So um, I just wanted to somewhat preface that that's where I really want our minds to be is that it's about that money component, because um, that's one thing I don't think that the girls have talked about themselves year almost of being here it is about that that is one of the big things that they're doing is going after a lot of grant money um and hopefully a couple more that they've already applied for we end up getting news about in the next several months but we won't know until we know yeah i mean that i think i think that's fair i mean definitely we need for everything that has to do with infrastructure we're going to need grant money anyway so i think that's going to be hard for us but to do it on our own. all right so um Going back to questions and comments. I could just, I just said, uh, the urban force has a plan on that paper is number two or is it, or is it not there actually? No, it's in number two right now. Okay. I just, it, but, yeah, but it's, it's kind of vocalized. So I wasn't sure. Yeah, there is, because it's also, I mean, there is some work that can be done about it. And we talked about that yeah. last time when we approved it. We can do it ready to go, you know, to, you know, to basic, to go out and, and, and get the higher consultant. Did, but I think did, we did need- Did council ask for the urban forest master plan? I, I personally like, the idea of doing that and would like to see it, but I don't recall council saying this is a priority. Well, you, what's it's the, it's actually what is it? What's the term in the cap? It's not called urban forest master plan. No, it's, it's uh, a, there is. It's a it's a the urban forest master master plan. So, so, but you're, so yeah. what I'm hearing is that you're taking your 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 impetus from the cap on this. Yes, mm -hmm. this comes from the cap. Yeah, all, all of all of most of the work plan is comes from the camp. And that's what that's what we worked out back in right. April. So and one of the reasons why I actually had this is gonna be my requirement for anything that goes on with any commission is that there has to be the funding column. And as much as I want it to happen, that's partly why I wanted to someone understand is like it, it at today, that master, I'm just gonna be as straightforward. This is how I am with all commissioners of other commissions I oversee and the council even, we don't have money for it. It's not happening until we have money. The quote that the subcommittee got for us, thank you for doing it. I had no idea, $200,000, we don't have the money for. Yeah, but then just to clarify, <laughs> based on you question. might consider just moving it down, keeping yeah. it on the work plan. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, about, but it's just an unfunded, yes, it's an unfunded need and and uh, so you might consider, you know, you might consider. But, but it looks like all our work plan is unfunded. Yeah. If I go through this, there's nothing that has funding. So this is well, just. There's some things that don't need funding. Well, some what? Things just that, uh, single use plastics. Everything else is granted. Well, so the, but that's also the where I think the, I don't think the, this plan from my understanding, and I've watched the commission, I mean, the, the environmental coordinators need to be consulted too. I are involved in our CAP. But if there's money dependent things on them, I mean, I, I don't know where did we think we were getting, you know, the no, money from because well, that, that's the big issue that we have. Take every action in the yeah, cap. Right, right. We didn't right. take every yeah, action at the last cap. So that's so, actually not my question. So that itself that's, that's, that's enough to justify. That's not my question. When I look at the work plan, I don't see work. Uh, quite frankly, because well, there's everything. a lot of work involved in the plastics ordinance, okay? Because that's going to involve public outreach, and one of the, the commission and and met for is to be a vehicle for the public's interaction with the government process, for transparency into that process, and it would be the commission, the environmental commission, that would do things like workshops and public um, meetings and things like that, and, and engage also, I suppose, with the restaurant community or what have you, although that's probably going to be uh, Anthony Carnesecca doing some of that directly, but there's a lot of work to be done that doesn't require funding for that particular project. And so it's really an ideal thing for the commission to sink its teeth into. Well, I, I think I just wanted to clarify something around all this because 
the process up until now has been the commission works on its work plan with staff then goes to the council the work plan is reviewed by the council and the council approves the work plan or makes modifications of the work plan we haven't that, that we haven't had that process this year right so we didn't go to council so now the process is different now the process is or as, as it should be for for all commissions council gives directly then you do the work plan that reflects the direction that you received from council. It is not a process that starts with the commission and then goes to council for approval. It's the other way around. And the vehicle for that is the CIP, right? And, and, and what we've done from a budgeting perspective, that's the best place to get guidance on where your work can be the most valuable. Um, so if I may, I guess minor thing, one, I think the reason the Currently now the urban forest management plan is at number two is because we are working on the on the it's ordinance. a legacy. I get no no because no because we are working on the ordinance and that's why the whole yeah. section was picked up. So I think it doesn't make sense for now for that to be number two. I'd be totally okay with that being split. But I think based on the guidance on the bigger picture, based on the guidance we've received from council, is that and I think it's in in the guidance that we're gonna talk about later, is that that's one of our our mandates is to to work in a you know to help move the climate action plan forward and that's i mean so that's just i'm just saying that based on what we were talking it's not it's not ad hoc it, 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 it's that, that, that's that's to, written that's written into the me. that's actually written into the to the to the ordinance that defines the commission so yeah right. that's true yeah. um but again Well, I, I think the commission has to be responsive to council. It serves at council's pleasure, yeah. right? And in this instance, I'm I'm speaking for council in this instance. I don't always do that, but there are times when council has already had a discussion or a vote and developed a, a, a guidance on a particular subject. And and so, you know, my, my suggestion is not. Uh, you know, it's not it's not a uh, setting something in stone to simply just move it down the list. I think I think there's some agreement with that. And and again, the, the plastics ordinance. You know, to me now from staff and from from council that there's great value in that. I mean, I'd like to get rid of I'd like to get rid of all the plastic there is. Just about you know, that's that's. Look at the list of things on the contract plan and on the work plan. There are some things that really move the needle, that really move the needle. Building elect electrification really moves the needle for climate change. You know, um, the, 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 the urban forest master plan is not going to move the needle for climate, for climate change. It's important, but as you compare the different elements of the, of the cap, the tree canopy is, far, you know, uh, building electrification in terms of its ability to to make a, a, a favorable impact. Well, but I think we need to look at climate action and climate adaptation. Yes, mm -hmm. the one forest master plan in terms of climate adaptation is important. That's a good point. That's a very good point. So I think we need to look at both. I think I'm not saying jettison it. I'm not yeah, saying. Yeah. I mean, I'm, just saying I'm just saying. I'm just saying. That's why I think we need as as a as a commission and as being responsible of the management of the cap and the we need to look at the, the action and the action that will move the needle. And we need to look at the adaptation because we need to adapt. We have no choice. And I think there are some, we need to bring both to the council right. and say, this is yes. what we like to do this year because yes. it's going to move the needle there. And then it's going to, an adaptation is going to be uh, important. Laura, I wanted, you wanted to say something? I just wanted to say that I, the way I look at it is, you know, for me, this should reflect the areas that the commission can provide the most value. It's not clear to me um, where the commission provides a lot of value to fleet electrification planning. That seems to me mostly something that is will is and will be staff driven and, and again will be driven by funding. I'm not sure how much value we add about saying 
you know, put chargers here or there versus helping to develop single use plastic ordinance that we already have gone through the process. We've, you know, we did have a, a draft, which was very narrow, but we do have some expertise on the commission and I think could provide some valuable input into a policy direction there. So to me, that's where, how we should prioritize. I mean, I don't think the commission will or needs to be involved in every action and in the climate action plan. So where is it that we add the most value to staff and to the city to move things forward? Yeah, I mean, uh... They're all good points. Uh, it should, we just need to understand that of the list that we have in there, uh, you know, there are things that are more important than others. And that's the, the one we should be focusing on, whether staff provide most of the work. And usually staff does provide a lot of the work, if not most of the work. Um, you know, I think I think uh, we just, just to come to an agreement. And then we need to decide what we want to do with this also in terms of well, Communicated that communicating that to council because that's the other point. Since there is not a formal meeting set up right now, we need to find we need we do an annual report number one and two. And with this annual report, we need to provide some kind of an idea of what we want to focus on, and then council can decide whether they want us to do that or not. I mean, then one though was not something that was in our work plan; it was something that was requested by the council. So, just let I me mean, give an example of. Whether it's not necessary. And you may have, and you may have a few plan too. Uh, um, staff previously said, you know, hey, can you boil it down to three to five things? And it looks like you've got more like eight or nine, um, maybe seven. So if there are one or two things that you feel like you can remove from the work plan. I mean, ideally, at the end of the year, you want to be able to present a narrative that says we moved forward on all of the things on our plan. And in fact, the three of the five things are done and these other two things are halfway done. You know, you don't want to have things on your work plan that didn't advance at all in a given year. Yeah, I mean. Things change also over yeah, the year. Yeah. I, think, I think you know, yeah. and I think that there is the flexibility in what we have there to move things around depending on what becomes available, whether it's a grant process or whatever. So, because not the whole process here is also to focus on three or four actions, right? That's that's what we wanted to do today, and then come to an agreement on that. Um, so, what I'm hearing is single use plastic definitely should be. I don't know if it's number one or number two or whatever, but it should be there. Um, we knew that the urban forest management plan, we were limited in what we could do because we can't go out and ask for and find the consultant to help us for us. But what we can want in the, the urban forest master plan and then the, you know design an RFP that's ready to go once we get the money to be able to get to go out and get a consultant. Uh, in terms of building electrification, definitely that's where we can move the needle the most. And I think we have lined up already potential providers for that. Um, now, there is the issue of the budget, and I see one of them is budgeted already. So really the question becomes, you know, can we find a grant that's going to allow us to provide? Uh, and that's, you know, I would be surprised if there, if there isn't uh, something like that available right now. And then the other one, emergency management, resilience, transportation, uh, I'm going to take the GHE inventory aside for, for a moment because that's also not necessarily a commission uh, task, but that's something we need to do as part of the camp. But emergency management, resilience, and transportation, these are items that we can set aside, see what happens. Uh, so trying to move the the process a little bit forward. Are we okay with what we have right now, which is number one, grading city operations, understanding there are two things that can be done and actually being done as we speak is work with SVC for the fleet electrification and working with bearing technical assistance for the building audit. Single use plastics would become two. Um, and then three would be the accelerate the existing building electrification. And then number four would be the urban forest management plan. 
Are we good with that? Laura, would you support that? Are you good with that? Yeah, that, that's good. And the fun part is, is next time we knock something off the list, we'll just come back and talk about the same list again all over again to see we what go we're going to add. We go back down there? <laughs> yeah. All right. So, okay. So now before we move, make the vote, and there's a couple of things I wanted to say. Um, I 2020 or 2021 to be done this year. So that's because if you look in the cap, there's a requirement in the cap. And I think we should do it because if we don't do it on a regular basis, we're not going to be able to know what what, what impact we're having with the implementation of the cap. So um, I would my I would request that something that staff put on their list of things to do is to do uh, depending on data what data are available, do a GAG inventory for 2020. One it was 2018. And then, you know, and I, and I think, you know, we can talk about how to do the work. I can put you in touch with the right people because we have the right people. Um, and uh, and then we can review that and bring that to council as well as part of the things that can be presented to council as in the general report or formally to the council. May I comment on that? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Um, I went uh, since 2020 and 2021, both the heavily impacted by COVID. I don't think those would reflect on where we're going. So I wouldn't prioritize getting those in, you know, the inventory for those two years. I think it would, my suggestion would be maybe, maybe wait until 2022. Uh, and since, you know, as you as you make, if we, if we have the funds to do it and we're, we can put it on priority grade, but I wouldn't push but it. There's no money involved. It's more staff, staff time. Yeah, That's which is money. So, so why is it on the work plan? If it's on the commission, the work plan items, the staff work. It's also a good question. What? I mean, what is the commission going to do for this particular initiative? I, I, I'm asking a clarification question. I, I Please don't interpret it as a challenge. It's just that yeah. I don't understand why something that, that staff is going to do entirely is on a commission work plan unless unless you're in the room you know in the review loop or something like that. We we would be in the review loop uh, most likely. So we would we would be when that's been done and look at the inventory compared to what we had in the past, the 2018 being the benchmark here for us. It's if the cap was based on that. And then we would uh, you know basically have a discussion around what what's what's we're not doing right or what we're doing because you you're able to look at specific uh, sectors within that uh, inventory so you can see what you're doing in terms of building electrification you're using your your so, carbon so, but, so is the inventory done by a consultant or is it done by staff this that, was, done, that, staff, was, by that was done for at the time because that was done as part of yeah but if we 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 uh, the uh, we we paying for the clear path using the for using the clear path uh, tool to be mm -hmm. able to do it. So it's a I, mean, I haven't done it myself, but it's a matter of gathering the data for the from the various service providers and putting the data into the system and the system the software is going to basically. Yeah. Nick, do you condition. want to explain how how is how the staff how is that going to be conducted? How is staff going to is is staff going to use this tool gathering and Yes. So, I mean, generally speaking, something like that is, I mean, it can be, there, there can be essentially something that's just built in as it. So, well, I guess not annually because it's not done every single year, but when we report out to you guys is that we bring it to you as a report, but it's not really an action item. Um, and I think that's honestly something that Tanya and Casey have really struggled with is like, well, what's the involvement of the commission or what's the involvement of us? Because if it's something that we're just waiting on the report and the data to be able to compile part of kind of what we do with any other commission rather than that it's a part of your guys's work now so when it comes ahead. back to yeah. commission it's going to come back to me, to commission to your commission as an information item and staff is going to give you a report yeah. and you can certainly comment on it and everything else uh and 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 and, and that's 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 about it is what it sounds like you're going to you're going to review it and, and you will have several reports given to you by staff and other institutions over the plan. Things that are on the work plan should be the things that you're going to agendize and take up and, and you know, 
give the public an opportunity to come in and comment on and 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 all of those things. I, I don't think this is a I really don't think this is a work plan item. And that's consistent with what I've heard from uh, the city manager as well. I mean, he and I have conferred and that's my opinion. Nick, do you have do you want to weigh in on this? For the for the GHG one that we're talking about, yeah, yeah. I mean, I I think that this is something that it's kind of like we, we have with our other commissions is that we yeah we will report out to you when the report is ready to be done. I I do want to say I do think that the data would be very skewed if we did it until I think we, I mean we're on the precipice of closing out very quickly 2023 unfortunately it's gone by fast so i mean we'll have the 2022 data before we even know it so i think that's probably the more advantageous one for us to actually truly kind of go from because i mean i will say just in other components of like i mean this is sustainability and the environmental commission but it is a it's a planning like theory and practice and I will say is like, even in the planning discipline specifically, we have seen extremely skewed numbers from the 19, 20 and 21 years because of COVID. Um, it's just it's just what we're stuck with right now. So that's why a lot of our regional partners for things like this type of a report are waiting until the 22 years to be able to truly get some kind of tangible numbers that are really showing, okay, where are we at now? Because I think it's now gotten exacerbated even further than some of the numbers that we're going to see from a little bit of older data now. So, so more than one reason that really probably to not have it on this year's report. And 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 if there's a, a a real active value add for the commission in the inventory, uh, then we can revisit this discussion when we look at next year's report. Well, I mean, it's an action, it's it's a tool that we will use to be able to plan that and to see if, if what we're doing is, is having an impact, right? So it's not something we'll be doing, something we'll be reviewing and use information from that inventory to be able to bring forward yes. different actions, change the cap potentially. Give or you change, the yeah. right? Staff is but it's an actionable yeah. item. Yeah, what's what's actionable about it? What what? No, what what we take out of it is gonna it's gonna have an impact on Tell potentially refining the cap, potentially reprioritizing actions for the following year and the and the other and the following years. But that's not an action item. That's an information item. An action item is: Are we going to do X or Y? You know, this is this is this is this is this, is, this will come back to you on an agenda as an information item. And that's not as an item on which you would vote. And uh, no, 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 definitely not. That's for sure. Yeah. So, yeah. No, that so if it's not an action item in any way, it shouldn't be. Yes, I just want to make sure it's done on a regular basis. That's all I'm working on. Uh, yes, as long as I agree with you. Know. If staff is saying we're going to be doing the, that every two years starting happen, in 2022, if there's other things. That's fine. We don't have to talk about it. I just want to make sure that every two years, yeah, we, we get a report. Yeah. You get a report. Yes, that's yeah. what I want. Yes, and the just, that's the reason yeah. why it's in there because yes. we'll make sure it happens. Yes, but that is not a reason to have something in the work plan. That's fine. That's fine. That is not why. I'm not okay to remove it from the work plan as long as there is an understanding that it's going to happen. And if we have to wait until we get data for 2022 because we believe 2020, 2029, 21 are not going to give you the right type of information, mm -hmm. that's fine too. But as long as long there is an agreement mm -hmm. and we get kind of an idea of when it's going to happen, mm -hmm. that's great. Yeah. So we have our internal list beyond just what this list is. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, all right. So are we so are we good with what we just discussed? So. Number one is green seed operation. Number two is single use plastics. Number three is accelerate existing building electrification. Number four is urban forest management plan. And then the other one we leave there, but there is no priority right now. We're waiting to see how we move on the first four and whether or whether there is a grant that just becomes available to be able to move one of the other items forward. It's, are we okay with that? Mm -hmm. All right, we need to make a motion, right? We need to vote. 
Who wants to make the motion? God is making the motion to agree with the work plan as stated. That's just it. I second. Okay, I'll take a vote. Um, Chair Delegate? Yes. Vice Chair Heck? Yes. Commissioner Liv? Yes. Commissioner Benny? Yes. Commissioner Ryan? Yes. Commissioner Texler? Yes. Okay, motion passes. Okay, very good. And before we close that, I just wanted to bring something up. Um, so the next question is communication to council. Right. So Tom and I have worked on a report like we do every year before we go to council to make a presentation on what we've done, in the, what was accomplished and what we're planning to do. So we've to council in May or June, uh, if we had the meeting, uh, the meeting never happened. So um, we do, as part of the commission duties, we do, we, we, we are due an annual report that needs to go to council. So what I'm suggesting is this, now that we have a work plan that we agreed upon, we voted upon, and you know we have a annual report that's ready to go that Tom and I have worked on, um, I want I want your feedback on uh, my proposal would be to send this to council um, for information so that they have the annual report, they have the accomplishments for for, for the year the past year, and then uh, the the proposed work plan because that's the only process that's the only process I know of right now since there is no formal meeting that's scheduled as far as I know. Yeah, there's there's nothing um, okay, so, on the upcoming council agendas for individual commissions. So I just I just you know I, my the, the question is, is what do we do with that? We need to communicate to council. I suggest that we communicate to council through the other process, which is basically sending an email with the document that touched. Yeah, I, I don't. I, I'm not aware of another option. Yeah, uh, I'm not aware of another option either. Would we review with the commission review the report? At um, the next commission meeting. Uh, that's going to be September. So I, I think it's if we want to have the, every com you know, commission review what we worked on. Um, I think the, probably the best way to do it is have Tanya send an email to all the commissioners and collect the uh, the comments from. Them. Put it on your agenda. Public see it. Yeah. So every so that's that's partly the biggest issue that we're going to keep on getting running into and. And council member daily is right and it's, it is echoed by all five um of the council members is that everything does have to go through the the public process and i know that every four weeks seems like a long time but um it's really not in regards to just us even getting it to the agenda and then post it on the website and everything i mean it does take time leading up to it so Everything has to be posted ahead of time um, and discussed, or or not even discussed as long as it's posted to the agenda and you guys look at it or a test that you have and that yep you, no one has any comments on it it's it's up for public display and then this is the the in public dis agree to this no changes even if it's like on the consent calendar and you really don't pull it or talk about it it has to go through that process. Um, and just like everything, it has everything has to get funneled through staff. This is it, it's just the public process in every city. All right. So your recommendation is to put that on the agenda for the September meeting. Yes. And so, so whatever with the, with the report as an attachment to the okay. as part of the the attachments of yeah. So what Tanya can do is she can clean up the the work plan. Um, she can show that to you guys, and if you guys want to vote on it. And then it's it's not really the commission transmitting something to council. It's Tanya would prepare just like a one pager report that then goes to council stating what they're getting, what the annual report is, and then of the commission if the council wants to pull it. I mean, the council members, everyone reads every single page. I don't know how, how they do it because some of them have very you know, rigorous per, um, professional lives, but they, they do. And so if they want to pull it and say, no, we're not okay with X, Y, and Z of your work plan, or they want to ask questions about the, about the report, then that's, then that's what they can do. So, um, I mean, and then that's, that's actually 
so kind of somewhat going back to, I know that the question has been about a commission delegate, which you can't have a standing commission delegate. However, is if there's something that has been memorialized, let's say at the September meeting, and you guys all vote on it, and one of you happens to be at the council meeting, and a council member has a question about something that's in the written document that was for, um, publicly acknowledged and agreed to by the majority of the commission, you can help to elaborate on it, not go down the rabbit hole with it, but that's how you can do that. But it's a part of the public process that was memorialized at a prior meeting. So you're always going to be one month behind the council. There's no way to not do it. Okay, so we'll put that on the agenda, mm -hmm. a September meeting, and we'll, uh, well, I don't have much to revise, but I will revise based on the, the updated work plan. That's when I need to do that. And then at some points before the meeting in September, you'll get it to put into the the so, doc, the, so let's the doc. back into some 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 deadlines, right? So for your meeting in September, when does staff need all the materials to be finalized? And by the way, staff has the editorial review rights on anything that we're talking about, right? So it's you have to get it to staff early enough that staff can iterate with you if it needs to and then staff can meet the noticing requirements in our uh in our norms that we have established right so so nick maybe you want to so we need at a minimum it. two weeks in advance you have this yeah. yeah it's not it's, it's ready to go it's right. just a tweaking it. yeah and so. then yeah and so and something like that would then we would have to then be able to adhere to, um, and then the council noticing requirements to get it into the paper and everything, because those those agendas are fully noticed. That has to go. Um, that has to be a minimum of three weeks in advance. So I mean, realistically, it's it's a process. I mean, that's just a part of it, but it can it can happen. It's just we have to follow the protocol. Right. So. And then it also does depend on what else is going on on the council agenda. For example, the one in yeah, I mean, oh, I, we, <laughs> it's what, what, not pleasant. It's going to be crazy. We yeah, met for a month. Next, week. I think what we're trying to do is try to find a way of communicating what we've done and what we're planning to do mm -hmm. to council. Yep. That's the only thing we're trying to do since yep. there is no formal process anymore. So okay, so we'll do that September. It's going to be agendized, uh, and then uh, yeah, and then you'll get it. Way before the deadline. Mm -hmm. good, good, good. And we may end up doing, I don't know when we're going to schedule our joint meetings, but we'll do a joint meeting with the Environmental Commission. It'll be a joint council and commission meeting and commissions that particular night. Well, that's what you used, we used to have, right? And so we it was made to... joint, but now I don't know. Well, we had, yes, we had. So anyway, we, the yeah. idea is you you'll have the stuff and yeah. you can react to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I so all I'm saying is maybe in addition to receiving this report, we get our act together and get those joint meetings scheduled. Um, you know, and you end up being well ahead of the game because you've already done this, you know, reporting stuff. Yeah. More or less. All right. But so we have a plan of action. All right, moving on. So we good. Sorry. Oh uh, yeah. Um, Commissioner Texer needs to leave at ten. I was just making sure we still have a quorum. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we still have a quorum, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we good with that. We close, and then we move on to the information information items. First one is the commission and the handbook updates. Yes. And so I do just want to preface this that it is an informational item. This has already been adopted. Yes, um, there is no discussion. Yeah, there's not really any discussion. I would more so say just because it's already 10. If people have specific questions, just based on what Tanya is going to kind of briefly go over, um, I would say maybe you guys need to reach out individually to her about this specific um, item. But it's really just more of a reporting out on the commission handbook updates that have already taken place. Yeah. All right, so yeah, let's go ahead. 
Um, and again, just to reiterate what um, Dr. Zorn said is that this is just to go over what's already been established by the city council and to kind of give you guys a quick little update and any training on this. The focus is to go over the major updates of um, the changes to the Emar environmental commission in the ordinance and the commission handbook. Um, and I, I'm not going to go over this in detail, but I think everyone reviewed it when it was going to council. Um, and this is essentially what uh, was decided on um, for the new powers and duties. And um, uh, so I wanted to highlight some of the things that we've kind of been going over and that is now oops, in the handbook is, you know, unless speaking as an official spokesperson, commissioners must begin all written or verbal comments of, you know, I am a commissioner for the Environmental Commission, but I am speaking on behalf of myself um, and my own personal beliefs, unless it was agreed and voted upon in a meeting, in a commission meeting. Um, <clears throat> Something else that was added is when requesting staff to conduct research. Um, this needs to be to, so, sorry, can't speak anymore. <laughs> My brain is like, shut up. Um, request by commission or commissioners for assistance in completing research or analysis for benefit of the commission shall be directed to the side staff liaison. So, um, Nick. And then, um, Special meetings, um, they should be held in accordance with the provisions of regularly scheduled meetings and not impede city services and operations. So essentially, um, if there is a special meeting, it needs to, um, it would most likely be at the same time that we have our commission meetings, um, but it cannot impede city services and operations. Um, so we, you would work with me on that and then, um, Changing of a time, changing the time of a regular meeting. Um, so, I think we had discussed moving at at the time of the meeting or um, the day in the past, um, and this is allowed, but um, it needs to be approved by the entire commission. Um, okay, so the work plans. Um, they're gonna, you know focus on a 12 month period. Um, city council may amend the work plan uh, and the commission can request modifications once a quarter for consideration of the city council. Um, and any requested modification should be in line with the goals and objectives of the commission and the city. Future agenda items, um, it, it must be consistent with the approved work plan, but also, and I think we've talked about this before, but I just wanted to remind everyone that an agenda item needs could be requested during the meeting, during potential future agenda items section of the meeting, or it can be sent by email. But if that is, if it is sent by email, uh, the process is that I would bring it into the next meeting and say, you know, um, so and so commissioner requested that this be an agenda item. Does everyone want this to be agendized? And then it will be on a list. And um, the liaison in the chair will discuss, you know, when it, that is um, when a, an appropriate time for that to be on a future meeting is. Um, so my homework for everyone is to read and review the updated commission handbook. And um, I did provide that in the attachments as well as the red lines. Um, so you can see what's been changed. And that is it. Thank you. <laughs> Yay, homework. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right. Um, any questions, clarification? Get us questions. It, that, that's the final one. It was approved by the. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it's on the it's on the website. Sorry. Okay. They tabled it to Um, there are a couple items that are coming back. Uh, but this is it's pretty much final. 
yeah, this is final. Actually, yeah, there's some, like it overlaps with the ordinance. And I think, yeah, this is the final. Um, so if you have questions and want to read it, we address them to you. Yes. And if I can't answer them, I will go to the city clerk or you can call the city council directly. Yeah. Thank you. And I believe I did write in the staff report the date of when they they finalized this. I think it was July 11th. Yeah, yeah. yeah was it like July 11th or I think so. July, mm -hmm. I think it's July 11th. All right. And you can go. always ask me questions and email me questions. Yeah. Great. Help. So I, I think one of the things that I wanted to make sure was clear is the agenda items. How do we put it on the agenda? And I think I've had independent questions from several commissioners about that. So I'm, I'm hoping everything is clear now in terms of how the process is. You can send an email, you can call Tanya or whatever, and then it's discussed at the next commission meeting and we decide whether we want to agenda it or not. And that's so everyone can get a chance, you know, is, this, is that a priority for everyone? Okay. Good. All right. Are the city updates? So, um, so I think you guys all know that we launched the self-serve compost station. It's outside. Um, very, so nice. <laughs> very good. Well done. Yeah, so that's just an example of one of the things that we're working on that's not on, um, you know, the work plan that took a lot of time. Um, and I luckily, you know, have a background in waste, so um, it was probably a lot faster than it could have been. But uh, so, yeah, we're doing that seven days a week. We've already gone through 20 cubic yards of compost in a week, and we just ordered more. It'll be coming on Wednesday. And um, uh, so, yeah, I hope everyone is enjoying the compost. And, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it's good that everybody's gone through away the first uh, the yeah. first batch, right? Yeah. People need to take appointments still to pick no, up because they can just it's come difficult. and get you. Okay, that's good. You go with your garbage bags. You have two and a half, right? Let's leave it. Uh, and yeah. No, you control this. Two gallons. Yeah, because yeah, it's here. Oh, it's parking lot now. Yeah. It's not like at MSC anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> yes, and then. Um, we did, the city did receive 125K for the cool pavement pi pilot program from SVCE. So I just wanted to let you know about that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that, that's another thing that's really good actually because it's in the cap. It's uh, action 6.2B in the cap. Mm -hmm. yeah. Climate risk. It's uh, right. making sure that we pave our roads and sidewalks to be reflective. Yes. Oh, yeah. I think they're going to start. Uh, in the neighborhood here. Yeah, I think I there is the pilot point, right? the pilot program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Um, I think it's, it's going to be happening soon, right? Yeah, yeah we'd gonna... have to confirm with Marie Sully about exactly where it's going to get deployed. I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Yeah. So the only question I have about that, okay, is we go through the pilot program, we get the financing, what happens next? We do it, what happens next? I think that's a big part of the about the pilot is to see is like, is it actually a product that right. people are willing to do? Because I think then that's a part of the bigger conversation is like, what's the delta between this product and traditional? Um, so I think that's a bigger conversation that I think it was just like, hey, <laughs> we're getting it. Let's try it. Let's see yeah. if it even works or if it, um, you know, it, it does what we need it to um, and kind of go from there. You know, because there, there's a there's a big mindset change, you know, with um, with the transportation um, and kind of street maintenance um, kind of philosophy and everything. So um, right now, in regards to the materials that they're using, how we're actually measuring whether or not roads actually need to be repaved um, or resealed. Um, that's actually another thing that I learned at Stanford. I was like, wow, all right, this is interesting. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that's that's something that we would um, we'll be able to ask a little bit more once we know exactly kind of some of the strings that are attached probably to the grant as well. And it's a coating, right? It's just like a like a coating that you put on the pavement that's gonna be, I don't, we don't know how long it lasts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of using a pavement that's reflected, right. it's a coating that you apply to a pavement that already exists. And, and that's a part of the thing too, is how long does it actually last in regards right. to, um, you know, what's the, what's the benefit of it? Does it help to actually carry the life on of the actual slurry seal essentially or what is it that what other benefits do you get from it and i think that's still a little bit of that that pilot essentially 
And is that, and since that's a cap action item, maybe that's something we can have Marisa come, you know, give an informational yeah. presentation on in the future when yeah. she's ready. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we'd be good. Um, to learn more about it would be useful in terms of, you know, I think we can do some of our homework too in terms of understanding, you know, reflective paper and all that stuff. Because eventually it's going to come back to us at some point. We're going to have to decide what we want to do and what the options are. How we want to move forward with this. Okay. Um, some other more positive items are we had a summer intern, um, and they helped create an electric electrification resource page for commercial businesses. Um, so kind of like taking what we already have and then adding you know, information for commercial businesses. We haven't posted it on the website because um, we were in the process of reviewing, reviewing that. And they also worked on updating um, the alternatives to transportation page, which is also in review. So hopefully we'll have those updates up soon. And then um, we touched upon this earlier, but I've been working with SVCE um, on the um, fleet electrification, which is cap item 4.3A, developing a phase out schedule to replace all city owned fleet with electric vehicles and the infrastructure. Um, so we're kind of finishing up the first step of the process, which is getting all the data um, and uh, working with um, our fleet manager um, and SVCE's consultant and um, you know, they provide, they're providing a report and um, the next steps would be to uh, get a look at funding as well as like design for EBI. So we're moving forward on that. Um, and, you know, as Nick was saying earlier, it's something we have to jump on because we don't know when, how long SVC is going to be providing that's, you know, free technical assistance and, and so on. So. And then probably could get an update on that at some point when you guys are ready. Yes. Bring that back to the commission. Yeah. yeah, and that's all. That's all from my updates. All right. Um, I think we're going to talk about the July 11 meeting that happened uh, since last time we met. So I'll keep that for later when we get to that point. Uh, okay, you good? Yep. So, all right, commissioners' reports and comments. Updates from council meetings. I attended July or I, I watched July 11th. Mm -hmm. um, there were several things relevant to us. I'll we go through them. Um, the first was they recognized the Friends Stephen Creek Trail. It's the 30 year anniversary. There's five miles in Los Altos, in case you know, and another mile and a half in development. So, uh, and there is a trailblazer race on the 24th of September. So, if you're a runner, uh, support. I don't know. Different different walks. Walks. Is, is, is it walk? There's a walking walk? option. I don't know how long it was. They didn't. They didn't state. I didn't look it up. But <laughs> there was an event. If you want to support it, um, uh, then more relevant to us is the um, uh, the city staff had. Uh, I guess the council had requested looking at setbacks and where you can put mechanical equipment. Um, and the staff had come back and recommended a 10-foot um, setback for mechanical equipment on the side yards. Obviously, that conflicts quite a bit with electrification because if you're going to put heat pumps or anything else, uh, a majority of the time, that's where people are going to put it. That's where uh, almost everything goes, at least in my yard. Um, so there was quite a bit of discussion about that and the fact that that negatively impacts our goals under the cap. Uh, and I think there was some back and forth. Uh, there was uh, some discussion about whether to bring it to us to quickly look into it, but they have an October deadline and didn't think we could get it done by October, give them any input by October. So they uh, did not do that. And I think where they ended up was with a five yard, uh, sorry, cap that set back for mechanical equipment, which I think uh, sounds okay, given what I know about mostly uh, electrification equipment you would want to put on the side. Um, and I think they're going to open it up to changing that opinion to moving forward. If I've misrepresented that, let me know. Anybody else who was? Um, That's it, to a T. Yeah, all right. I good. was the one who said, screw <laughs> all this, let's make it five feet and move on. Yeah, yeah. And so that's that's where we ended up. Um, another relevant uh, uh, one to the, us was uh, Fleegor, uh 
brought up the reach codes and where we're at on that. Um, and I think uh, that ended up, they were gonna try to discuss it in a closed session because nothing's been done on the reach codes since the, it's on board, right? it's, the, the yeah. legal issues, but there was some discussion about can we do move some of it forward or not? And then let's have F SVCE come in and give us an update. But uh, I think the general feeling from the uh, council was that SVCE wouldn't give us any better insight than our own attorneys. Um, so I don't, I don't think there's any closure on how they're going to get an update. They added worse. Yeah. So no update on, no clear direction on what they can do or what they are going to do to see if we can do anything on which go. Uh, so it's still, in, sounded like to me it was still in a holding pattern unless they do something in a closed session, which I'm not sure they can do. Um, only other relevant thing is they're going to put a generator, a larger generator uh, for resilience at the um, community center. That was all that was relevant to us. That will be a gas generator. Yes, diesel. It's it is, it is not a solar generator yet. Yes, it's not a battery. Well, yeah. it's not. Like... No solar power. No. no. So I actually, yes, I, I, it turns out I listened to the journal eleven and you completely on exactly where what 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 was discussed there. Um, I just had. Couple of questions, and I know we're not supposed to be involved, but I'm going to get myself involved anyway. Um, so I had a question about the EOC generator. I just don't know what the process was around that and why it was decided to have a diesel generator to provide for grid outage um, when there are other options available. There are no other options that would suffice. The that power is. requirements are too substantial. Okay, so I, I was advocating batteries and solar, and we looked at other emergency operations centers and also at the uh, you know at the requirements, and we just can't meet them with with solar and batteries. Uh, electrolyzers, whatever they're not an option. I, that's not something that I that I don't know that technology well enough to 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 comment on that, but, you know, we did take a very, there was, there was a, a pretty robust effort to try to find a more sustainable solution. The good thing though, is that, you know, this generator is going to turn on once every week or month when it's tested and, you know, then in an emergency. But other than that, we're not looking at a chronic use of, of, of carbon fuel, you know, ongoing daily basis, just, just in an emergency. Yeah, we tried. So we this tried. is a, a decision that's been it's, made. It's done. It's yeah, done. it's done. I mean, we've so placed maybe the maybe it should be done for future. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, the, the real it's, question is. I yeah. do know of, of at least a couple of companies that make and several uh, commercial buildings. I don't know if it's too small of a scale for what they do, but um, I'll find out in a way. We'll cover any information on it. For future reference. Because I think the work is still being done, right? It's, it's there is a consultant that's working on no the, the plan is essentially done. It's done. Okay. It's, I mean it's like in the last it's stages be installed. Of, there is no it's not just ordered. Yeah. It's yeah. Bought. Yeah, it's yeah. it's everything's in like the last stages right. of the plan check process. The city okay. has spent well into the thousands of dollars in just design alone. Yeah, okay. So, so that, that, that I, what I did well, it was unclear because it was in the constant calendar and obviously was not mm -hmm. discussed at the meeting is whether this is going to be made, the generator was already in the process of being ordered, or whether some more work was going to be done to figure out exactly what generator the size of all that right. stuff. So if that's not the case, there is obviously nothing that can be done. <clears throat> that's my. I think it would be useful actually for us as a commission to look into other options because definitely that, I don't know if it's going to come up again, but I think I think back up option would be useful. Um, the thing about the, the mechanical equipment and the setbacks. Mm -hmm. So it has to do with noise regulation, right? Mm -hmm. Not the noise ordinance, right? It has to do to comply with the noise ordinance as we have it. Mm -hmm. So just throwing things out there, just I think it would be useful to take a look at the setbacks, keeping in mind how much noise, in, noise is being generated by the heat pump. Because you have heat pumps commercially available now by uh, all the various brands that generate 55 decibels or less. 
outside, right? So um, it may be, you know, just as you look into that, it might be useful to take a look whether it's possible to define setbacks based on the heat pump that's being the heat pump or whatever is installed. We decided not to use noise as as a. We we looked at that. Mm -hmm. This this is done. Yeah, it's 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 done. They decided five feet. It's going to. It, they voted. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Not that. Our feet is pretty good. Pretty good. We have mostly in in both Nick and speak to this much better than I but you know most most of our residents have you know a 10 foot setback and so this gives them five feet to operate with yeah there are going to be some for whom this will be a constraint there is there is not a single residential deployment that needs to protrude five feet away from a, a wall right which means that there's five feet of clearance um for 90 percent of residential properties in the city of Los Altos um, I mean, you would have to be stacking units like on purpose to like, you know, get as close to the property line as you can. It's just you just don't do that. And then you actually really don't do it because of the the power source and then actually what's feeding back into the property. I mean, it's supposed to be as close to the building as possible. And so. there's exceptions for ADUs and super narrow lots. Uh, kind of, but well, for yeah, but for ADUs, the but then the mechanical equipment has to be sited on the inside portion of like instead of the outward facing towards the property line, okay. so that it is further away. So there's there there's the complexities of I understand what the commission might be concerned with, and then the then the complexities of then there's the zoning component, which is the planning commission, which is not the purview. So when we talk about setbacks, this commission will never actually truly talk about the setbacks. Right. It's more about then is it going to be a hindrance? But at five feet, there's just no argument. I mean, you can still do a heat pump. I mean, heat pumps can be as small as as this. I mean, you know. And I guess for ADUs, it doesn't matter because if they're required. So correct. Yeah. Whether it's not deterring someone from correct. putting in a heat pump. The 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 full crux of this issue is predominantly what the ordinance was crafted for is for to capture um like AC handling equipment. Like the heat pump thing is not really something that we've actually had a noise complaint violation over. This is going to be just the mechanism for further enforcement capabilities of the louder equipment. AC units are louder equipment. Um, I mean, we have we have more lenient regulations on on a uh, pool equipment than we do on AC units before this ordinance, which is crazy because pool equipment is very loud when it's on and actually yeah. cleaning the, well, the the pumps are doing that. <laughs> so. All right. Okay. So good. There were, uh, were there other um, council meetings uh, in, at the end of June? There's one in June that yeah. I was supposed to, I, I watched, but I don't have my notes, so I'll defer. Was there anything relevant? I don't think so. Okay. I can't remember. June All right. 13th. I don't, I, I barely remember the last meeting. <laughs> um, um, no, I think we're good on that. We need to talk about city council assignments for September. Yes. So 912 and 926 are going to need volunteers for those two. Uh, and I can I can't I can't do 912 and 926. So I'm sorry. So we've signed up for August then. What? Yes. I must I think that's the case. So. Yeah, yeah, we all signed up to the end of August, but we haven't done September the next I'll, I'll take it another one in September. Okay. Uh, thank you. I can take uh, 26. I'll take it. Oh, no, I can't get 26. I cannot do 12. I actually I can do 12. just returned from on travel. So I could do 26. Okay. I can do 12 unless somebody else wants to do 12. I can't do it. Yeah. Okay. 12 for uh, thumb and 26 for shopping. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Potential future agenda items. Um, you had proposed an agenda item. I just wanted to right. the uh, discuss it. Okay, I know it's very late. I'll be quick. Uh, tomorrow, the Santa Clara uh, County Supervisor will meet. He 
have an agenda item. They actually have been working with uh, the Lehigh Summit. So they are to approve a binding agreement that they will permanently cease uh, the cement kiln operation, no longer making cement. But they still have the business. Uh, last time I had this gripe is that, you know, from the quarry, they still have all this, um, what do you call this kind of a material they call aggregate. So they still doing a lot of this kind of a selling and transportation. So the pollution, the traffic noises and are still there. Um, this is the first step of the bigger planning is that first of all, they don't, they no longer make the cement. And you know, that involves very high temperature and and everyone knows in you know, all the neighboring city are being affected by that. So, so uh, they are encouraging us to uh, have a supporting statement. Uh, and but I think that we can uh, discuss. You know, we can represent Los Angeles City. Uh, I think it's for the, the the whole comprehensive plan. One is that you know uh, support the uh, you know the approval and the implementation of this binding agreement. I think they want it, uh, you know, if tomorrow everything goes well, I think they will uh, like uh, make that as a as an achievement at the end of the fiscal year for the for the county. And then the next step would be that they no longer quarry, no longer dig, you know, from the pit. Uh, so that would be the, the second step. And the third step is, is very important is the reclamation plan. Uh, you know, how uh, that is going to be, since I think 90% of what they operate is considered an incorporated area of the county and then 10% is the city of Cupertino. Uh, and there are some, I think Palo Alto also has part of, you know, the, the whole uh, 3,300, basically a little bit 3,000 acres that that's what they're operating on. Um, so I feel we could discuss as a group in, in the next meeting, um, and uh, I could uh, prepare a draft statement that we support this whole uh, uh, goal that we support the county uh, to move forward with this because there are still two more steps that uh, you know they need to accomplish and the timeline for that that still uh, you know need to be developed. But basically, I think we like our bridge, the open space, to be restored. Yeah, we would. And that takes very careful planning. Um, you know, my suggestion is that you ask the county to come and present to you. So you oh, can okay. you can get somebody from the county okay. to come to your meeting. That sounds good. Make a presentation. That way, our citizens get to understand too. And in my opinion, in my in my view, even though we don't own part of the, and it's not part of you know, it's not that the quarry doesn't sit in our jurisdiction the way it sits in the counties and and Cupertino's. But they've poisoned two creeks that run through our town. So we absolutely have, and and they poison our air. So we absolutely have a vested interest in this topic. Yeah. Okay. That sounds good. So I'll do that. Um, awesome. I'll do that. So I mean, staff, you're hey, to call the, the communication with the county should be staff to staff. Mm -hmm. Somebody in staff should ask the county to come and, and talk to us. But, okay. but, but for you to make the statement, to start working on the yeah. resolution right. that, that the commission wants to pass. Yeah. So, so and there's a couple of ways you could do that, right? You could make a resolution and then kick it up to council and say, we are recommending that you adopt this resolution, or you can just adopt a resolution on your own. It would probably have a little bit more power if you crafted it in a way that it goes from you to council and then exactly. I think yeah, yeah. I think it's kind of represent our city. Mm -hmm. yeah, and you get a position. lot of public support for this yeah. in town. And and I will be a strong advocate as well. Okay. I'm pretty sure how the so council is there a deadline? Yeah, the, 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 
Do we have to get this done by so? So, so my understanding, and, and you may have better. Yes, understanding for tomorrow. I, so there's a meeting tomorrow. That ship is going to already have sailed, right? That's right. But some of the controversy actually centers around the reclamation plan yes. because the cement company wants to actually bring in material from outside of the core yes, to refill it, right? Which means hundreds of truckloads. Six hundred trucks a day. Yeah, yeah, that's not the right. The traffic is that's already not, right now. That was crazy. No, I hate that's those not, trucks. It's just not even yeah. possible. But but yes. And so so many, I think many environmental advocates who are concerned with with the cement quarry um want as much of the fill to come from the existing site because they have uh slag piles. They, they have they have a lot of material that they can use. So right. we can influence the county in a way Basically, we're, we're we're trying to force the county to tighten their oversight right. of, of the of, of this company, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, and it's great that the kiln is not going to be working, but guess what? The kiln hasn't been working for like four years. Um, I think since like April twenty twenty. Yeah, we, we will say it's about three years. Three. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Because there, there was some a problem with the kiln. I right. think it's I think not. They know I mean, it's not like safe the, to operate. We, we haven't. The, yeah, this, the, the company wants us to think that this is some sort of a uh, an accomplishment that we've gotten from them, but it's not. It's a business consideration. They're not going to. They can't. They're, they're not really able to. That's to right. Yeah. yeah, it would be dangerous. Is it, do you have a timeline for getting a letter of support? Or not? Um. So. I think that we're not going for to be tomorrow, able to discuss it at this time. So, right. So. But what I what I really want to achieve is that we support further uh, counties uh, really have a way to stop them from quarry continue because that part mm -hmm. is not a done deal. So it's two and three. That's it's right. two, two and three. And three. I feel mountain wise. Stop yeah. the quarry and then yeah, yeah. your reclamation. Exactly. So, so we yeah. as a city yeah. as a whole. Yeah. Is there a, a good resource you could send to me? I could have, I could, have, yeah, I have to be in touch uh, with uh, one of the civilian, Joe civilian staff. Uh, I can okay. find Yeah, it. that's 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 the way to go. Yeah. yeah. Put Joe so, staff in, in touch, and I'll call Joe. Yeah. Joe actually comes over, uh, you know, the farmer's market. Yeah. Probably, I guess, once every six weeks. Yeah, I, know. Yeah. I also have lunch with him yeah. on a regular basis. So why don't you coordinate with Tanya? Okay. Put that on the September agenda. If yeah. Everybody's okay with that. Yeah. Yeah. And then what I would suggest, if we want a resolution from us, or that a resolution from us that goes to council for council to make their own resolution, uh, you should draft something for us to review in September, since we're gonna talk about yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a good plan. Okay. Tanya, when you put this on the agenda. If you're able to get somebody from Joe's office to come and, and, and give an update, it would be both an information item and an action item on the agenda because your action is, you know, whatever resolution you, 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 you vote on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's probably information for and then action yeah. on yeah. the resolution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it may actually advise. may even be two items. Two items on the right? yeah. yeah. All right. Is there any other potential agenda items anyone wants to? Um, so I'm following up with Bitney actually. Uh, so I'm I'm gonna try to get in touch with the CEO and see if we can if it makes sense to bring them on to make a presentation. I need to better understand what really they can provide us. But the tariff on bill I need to get back to SVC also. So I haven't it's not ready. This time. I need to get back to that. Any other? There were other agenda items actually. Um, I was looking at the last, but the yeah. permitting process for heat pumps. Yeah. So um, we have so, so the gas the, the ones we had the gas power yeah. heat flows, That's that's the um, yeah. the permitting process for heat pumps, solar panels, and battery storage. That's what that's what it, that's something we wanted to review to get an understanding of how it it works. And whether there is there is any anything the commission should be recommending to council in terms of potentially making it easier for people to electrify. Basically, that's what it is about. So uh, that requires staff from a different department probably to come in and make a presentation and then have us ask questions and so on and then decide whether we want to move do something about it. And the whole, the whole idea there is it's going back to setbacks and everything, although it's different. It's 
we want to make it as easy as possible for people to electrify the, the building install solar panels and so on so we need but we don't know what the permitting what the permitting process is in los altos right now we need to understand that to be able to decide whether we want to do something about it or not. Yeah, I mean, I can really just tell. So, solar panels is essentially like an over the counter permit. There's really not anything for us to. I mean, if you Google it, California, you, it's it's pretty much like almost your next day permit for it. Um, the complexity is is things that is associated with potential battery, and that's because of what battery they're wanting to use with what load they're essentially generating. So we could maybe give you somewhat, but there's really not a permitting issue with it. It's really not. It's what honestly what that is more about. It's about the actual people doing the installs and getting the people to actually do the job. Or quite honestly, I can tell you, and this is not to just keep on name dropping. At Stanford, they literally were talking about how they just built a brand new um, battery uh, uh, battery plant in Mexico, right on the other side of the border, because. They're one, going to be one of the first to be able to do mass production of battery for solar backups. Um, and it's like just coming online right now. Um, it's in Monterey, Mexico. And so that's one of the big things because our battery storage is in California. We have 3% of the batteries that we should have. We're that far behind. It's actually not solar generation that we're behind. It's battery. It's and there's no issue. It's literally just about the manufacturing. The heat pump one I can talk about with the building official because I really, honestly, we don't have people coming in as you know as hotcakes like with battery storage or solar. But solar is there's definitely zero issue with the solar component. That is literally people getting next day permits essentially. Well, okay. So I mean, that would be useful to to get that kind of information. I know we've heard from residents uh, about issues that, that they've had. With the permitting process for heat pumps and stuff like that, so I think it would be interesting for us to kind of take a look at that. So I, I let you decide when it can go on on one of the as an agenda item on one of the meetings, depending on the workload for every meeting and depending on discussions you have with the permitting department. See what's possible to do. Yeah, there is no urgency to it. It could be would be nice to have it this year. Just talk to her about soon so she can start looking into it. All right. Okay. So in, in, uh, that's that's what I was looking at the shoulder improvement policy. Uh, yeah, that goes back to something that the commission looked at and was implemented by the city. It's been done. It, 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 it's been in effect for I think four years now. Um, and the whole idea there was to take a look at how effective it is and whether we should take a look at it again. So there is no urgency on that. We can we can uh, discuss more about that. Uh, and yeah, I think it just again the based on the handbook update by the city council is that future agenda items must be consistent with the commission's approved work plan. So that one specifically is going to be it's a really hard plan. nexus because yeah. of the CSC. Yeah, but the the process for it pumps is part of the electricity. Yes, yep. so yeah. So we should definitely like tariff mm -hmm. on this. Yeah. Okay. So anything else? No. Okay. okay. So we good. Okay. Uh, during the meeting, 10.35, my watch anyway, I don't know exactly the exact time, <laughs> yeah. but thank you very much.